Good evening. Welcome to the Select Board meeting for today, July 9, 2019. We're airing on RCTV, cha uh, Verizon Channel 33, and Comcast Channel 22. So, um, on tonight's agenda, we'll have liaison reports followed by a town manager report and public comment. We'll be having a hearing on an alleged liquor violation at Bay State Liquors. Uh, then we'll have a vote to approve the Zani land acquisition, as well as a vote uh, to approve affordable housing monitor agent. Um, there's currently on the agenda a vote to approve the train depot renovation, though there's more updated information on that. That vote will not be taking place. We'll be reviewing zoning bylaw changes proposed for the November 2019 town meeting. We'll have a hearing to vote on various safety improvements presented by the police. Uh, a vote on the fiscal year 2020 election schedule, um, a discussion and possibly a vote to change the language forming the ad hoc human rights commission, and then we'll be discussing future agendas. So why don't we kick it off with liaison reports. Um, this time around, we'll start with Andy. Um, I, I have none. Okay. okay. Um, I will get to the ad hoc um, language at when that item appears mm -hmm. on the, the agenda. Um, the, the ad hoc committee is scheduled to meet uh, next Monday, but that will that meeting will likely be canceled due to a lack of a quorum. Um, it appears that the Tarrant Lane project is moving forward, and I've heard from a resident a request that we look at signage on in Reading um, to, to make clear uh, that where parking is appropriate and where parking is not appropriate. And I understand from Bob that that will be brought before the P forward to the PTTF for review. Um, HRAC is meeting again tomorrow evening. Um, they are looking for more members and encourage um, members of the public to attend in case they're interested. <coughs> The, uh, as many people are already aware, um, the superintendent is taking a leave of absence um, for personal and family reasons. Um, there is no acting or interim superintendent currently, and the school committee is working together with uh, district leadership. Um, and they can the school committee considers all of the central office administrators and building principals to be a highly functioning team to work and uh, that's working together throughout the summer um, and if, if in the event that the leave extends into the fall the school <coughs> committee will review the, that approach um, the school space study is moving forward uh, with an, an additional update expected to both the school committee and town meeting in the fall. All right, thank you. I, I don't have anything to report. Huh? Sorry. <laughs> that was quite an intro. Whatever. <laughs> Did you get walk on music? What's that? <laughs> Please continue. Um, just two quick things. One is that um, the RMLD um, is having a ribbon cutting to energy storage system for which they got a, a million dollar grant from this taking place tomorrow morning. Um, very exciting. It, it's going to hold quite a bit of, of energy so that we don't have to, it'll help us shred the peak basically. It'll hold a lot of stuff. Um, I wonder if I could just take a moment of, of personal privilege. At our last meeting, um, we weren't able to honor our colleague, John Halsey, who was right next to me here. Um, Ann and I were able to attend the Rotary Club installation dinner. More for the installation and less for the dinner, to be <laughs> accurate. Um, but um, they recognize each year someone they call a Paul Harris Fellow. And Paul Harris was the founder of Rotary International in 1905. And they've been giving out this award since 1956. And the club recognized our colleague John as a Paul Harris Fellow. And we want to congratulate him on that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mark, for those remarks. Uh, I actually do not have a liaison report this week either, so I will hand it to the town manager for a town manager <coughs> thank report. Thank you. I have a couple of quick updates. Um, on the train depot uh, painting uh, agenda item, yesterday we heard from Jonathan Barnes that the Reading Historical uh, Commission is working with the applicant. We have not actually heard back from the applicant, mm -hmm. so I assume there will be no action to take tonight. Um, I wanted to... Uh, Bob, I have an update on that okay, when we get to that point in the agenda. Now. Um, 
We can do it later. Okay. It's fine. Let's just stand back. Thanks. Um, John and Lee uh, Foy Young are working on an honorary thing for Camille Anthony. And I just wanted to give an update to the, to the board that um, uh, they want to come in at some future point and have a brief five minute update at a future meeting again. But for the community, um, the Reading Co op has set up a fund. It's called Services Timeless Fund. And if you could care to make a donation in Camille's name, uh, the Reading Co op is accepting uh, gifts at this time. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, I spoke to Brad Jones today, as I know uh, Vanessa did over the weekend. I'll, I'll bring up further remarks during the agenda item on Haverhill Street, or at least on parking and transportation, and I'll just have some updates for the board on that. And the last comment is um, Jean spoke to Brian Farless, the superintendent of Eastern Middlesex Mosquito, and has they have agreed to an improved notification process in the future so that we can let the community know in a timely way when they're going to spray. It is a little tricky because it is very weather dependent, but nonetheless, we should be able to get better information out next time. And that's all. Hey, a quick question on uh, Haverhill Street um, um, speed limit issue with the state. Did DOT just give you attachments, or was there a written document that came along with the attachments? Um, um, I included whatever they gave me in the packet. So I'm not sure how else to answer the question. There was two pages, two documents. And, and so they get handed you this And packet. also just, just to point out that mm. Vanessa has and has asked me and mentioned others if they want to speak about this, yeah. to wait until later in the evening. Oh, so sure. I don't want to omit anyone yeah, yeah, yeah. that might be interested in the topic. We, we do have some Got neighbors it. from that area that are going to be coming. So okay. And right. I told them we okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Great. Uh, okay. So we'll move on to public comment. Um, is there anyone who would like to speak for public comment before go Okay, great. Um, so I'd ask you to raise your hand. Please provide your name and address. Please keep comments to topics under the purview of this board. Uh, please no derogatory or campaign-related comments, and kindly keep comments to two minutes. So, Bill? Thank you. Bill Brown, at 28 Mac Road. Um, just for the information on the board, presently at the generosity of the high school PTO, there's now six flags over the honor roll at the high school. Um, in case you want to know, it's the Army, Marines, Navy, Coast Guard, and uh, Air Force, Coast Guard, and POW. Um, the other thing, I had the pleasure of going down to Fall River with Kevin and nine of us to see the groundbreaking ceremony for the uh, Vietnam Wall. It's going to be an 80% reproduction of the wall. I guess they can't do 100%. And it'll be the only wall within 50 miles. So it's going to be a nice wall once it's done. Uh, the other thing I found out the other day, I was looking for some information that I helped Bob on Cable Street in 1974. I didn't find any information on that, but the flag behind you, the town flag, uh, was officially uh, accepted in 1974. So it's 35 years old. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, Dr. Pearl Street. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. I know tonight you're going to have a hearing on the alleged liquor violations, mm -hmm. and I just am hoping that you keep this in mind when later in the year this board is going to be asked to extend liquor licenses to gas stations and convenience stores because the higher the density of available liquors, obviously you increase the potential for potential sales to minors. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay. Can just check the time, make sure we can start the hearing. Yeah, it's past 7.15. Excellent. Uh, so, uh, Mark, can I ask you to read the hearing notice? To the inhabitants of the town of Reading, please take notice that the select board as the licensing authority for the town of Reading will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, July 9th, 2019 at 7.15 p.m. in the select board's meeting room, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Massachusetts, to show cause why HT Reading Liquors LLC, DBA, Bay State Liquors, retail package store licensed to expose, keep for sale, and sell to and sell all kinds of alcoholic beverages should not be modified, suspended, or revoked for violating GL Chapter 138, Section 34, on May 18 and May 30, 2019, to wit, the sale or delivery of alcoholic beverages to a person under 21 years of age. 
the select board will consider each illegal sale or delivery to a person under 21 years of age to be a separate violation under the law. All interested parties may appear in person, may submit their comments in writing, or may email comments to townmanager at ci.reading.ma.us by order of Robert W. Lalasher, town manager, dated July 1st, 2019. Great. Thank you, Mark. So I'm going to go through the process of what this is going to look like before we hear testimony. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is swear in um, uh, our first witness, who is going to be from the police department. Uh, we'll hear that testimony for the board members. I would ask that we hold questions until uh, he completes it. The hearing, the testimony will take two parts. The first is the first alleged violation on May 18th. And the second part is the alleged violation on May 30th. Um, after that, we'll be hearing testimony from the licensee or their representative. We'll then open it up to public comment. Uh, we'll close the hearing, and then we'll have board deliberation. Um, after we hear testimony from both parties, at that point, we can ask questions. Um, for the board deliberation portion, we will be voting on each alleged violation. They are separate. Depending on the results of those two votes, we will vote to determine a, that a penalty, what penalty would be applied to each violation, if any is found. So, uh, the first thing I'd like to do is enter the police reports into the record for this public hearing. Um, and now we're going to hear from the police. So if I can have the Sergeant Tucker come up. Um, Bob, do you mind having him? Or are we going to need your? All right. Clark and, and we also have Deputy Chief Clark with us. Okay. Um, so, Bob, a question for you for a moment. Um, so, Lieutenant Detective, um, do you swear to or affirm that the evidence you are about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Deputy Chief Clark, uh, do you swear or affirm that the evidence you are about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Uh, second? Sure. Um, so, on May 18th, Officer Briere was on his field training with um, Officer Garrett. They made a motor vehicle stop, and during that motor vehicle stop, the, they illuminated some cases of Bud Lights in the rear of the motor vehicle. During their investigation with the passengers and the operator, they discovered that no one in that vehicle was 21 years old. They further discovered, through interviewing them, that they had purchased the alcohol at Bay State Liquors. They provided information that they had been doing that for a while in the beginning using a fake ID, and then they had been getting in there so long that they were no longer asked for ID, and that that particular time they did not ask for any ID. They had told the officers that they were willing to cooperate with any type of sting that the police department wanted to do on Bay State Liquors, and they had provided all of their information. They were subsequently charged with minor possession of alcohol. That was on May 18th, I think that was a Saturday. I review all reports on Monday morning and detectives for follow-up. So when I got that report, I contacted the ABCC to ask them their opinion on what steps we should take. They informed me that we had enough to violate Bay State just on um, the statements that the minors provided since they gave up any penal interest in that, that that's evidence enough to go forward. However, they did su suggest that we start conducting surveillance to see if there is a habitual issue at that liquor store. Um, we decided to use, we have a night detective, Mike Mulo. He started to do some random surveillance there. After about a week or so, we didn't see much going on, so the deputy approved some overtime. We had two detectives, and the first incident when we had two detectives was on May 31st. Um, they instantly observed a motor vehicle pull into the parking lot at Bay State. Um, the operator of the motor vehicle is noticeably under 21. They pulled right next to Detective Mulo. He could hear their conversation. The operator was talking to the passenger, giving them a list of alcohol to buy and what to buy. And as the passenger, the female, walked into the store, he yelled out, um, if you have any more money, get some extra shots. So what they thought they had at the time was actually someone buying alcohol for a minor. 
Um, they witnessed the individual go in the store, come out with a bunch of alcohol, put it in the car. They followed the vehicle. They had a patrol car. Once they saw a um, motor vehicle violation, they initiated a traffic stop. They approached the driver, who was 18 years old, very nervous, and during conversation, they asked the passenger how old she was, and she said 20. So they realized they actually had a violation at Bay State. <clears throat> they um, interviewed the two subjects. The female said that she had been going there for a while because everyone knows that they don't ask for ID. She identified um, the clerk, purchased the alcohol from. She actually made two transactions in the store. She got an, didn't get a receipt for the other. Um, the detectives went to the store to notify the business about the violations. Uh, they were first not met with a lot of cooperation, but then after some discussion, they got some cooperation. There were two clerks in there. They identified the clerk that was involved. They um, ultimately talked to the store owner, requested video, and they obtained that video, I think, a day or two later. So the, sco sco yeah, the store was informed that night that they were going to be getting violated for two violations that you have in front of you. Um, so before we um, hear testimony from the licensee or the representative, does the board have any questions at this time? D uh, just a quick one. Um, I think I read that when they went in initially, there was just one clerk, and they asked if there was a second clerk. Yes. And the person said no, there was not. Correct. And was there a language barrier, or was it clearly No, there understood? was no language barrier. They, um, you, their opinion was that he was trying to... Yes. You know, um, this direction, and not and, be honest. Okay. And then the second clerk showed up. Yeah, I think they actually even observed him duck in the back, and they said, we know there's another clerk here, and that's when they had the discussion with that clerk. And that was the clerk that sold the... Yes, though he was not forthcoming with his identification or name, and, um, there was a, and that was not a language barrier. That was just... No whole lot of cooperation there. I think when they were explaining the consequences of what was going to happen, the attitude sort of changed. Okay, thanks. Um, were the clerks involved tips trained? I don't know that. So the statement that they gave where they were family part-time employees. So I'm not sure if they had tips trained or not. Uh, it didn't come across that they were. It sounded like sometimes they might have just had people in the store working part time. That was well, we'll probably be able to find that out in a little while. So, yeah. I just point of information. You know, got a couple of clerks and. Um, I have a question. Um, what's the history of these types of gen violations generally in town? Is this a frequent occurrence? I don't think we've had one that we have discovered in a few uh, years. 2014. Yeah. Um, the ABCC does come in and conduct their own stings and other operations, and they have had a couple of violations, but on our end, we haven't had one in a bit. Um, the violations that they've found, have they been at this particular store or elsewhere? No, not there. Okay. Elsewhere. Elsewhere. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from the board? Um, probably not pertinent to, um, to Detective Abadi, but um, I think that this store has changed ownership over the course of the last handful of years. Is that correct? I think that it has. Uh, yes. Okay. So, you know, I mean, there's a there's a history at the location, and then there's a new history that is tied to the to new owners. I mean, and I say history not indicating that it's a bad one or a good one, but um, it's a little tough to, if you go, if you look back in time at the site, um, it would involve two different owners over the course of the last handful of years. I would, if I don't know the dates. Exactly. We might be able to ask that. Of I think there was Busa maybe before. Yeah, Sorry. Busa Liquors was uh, the, was prior before, and it was then sold. Um, so and um, so there's two different owners over the course of the last handful of years. Okay. Um, but I personally, I, I mean, I know that we have had some violations in front of the board. Um, I don't recall one for that location um, during that, but you know, that's a memory thing. I saw it. I'm not sure. Um, any other questions from the board? Okay. Thank you both Great. for your testimony. All right. Uh, now we will hear from the licensee or their representative. Good evening. 
Excuse me. My name is Jim Julio. My office is in Wakefield. I'm an attorney. And, um, where would you like us? Uh, you can have a seat right there. That's Great. Right. Would you come up, please? <coughs> Take another chair up. Yeah, do we have another chair that we can? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So for the record, again, my name is Jim DiGiulio. My office is the law offices of James DiGiulio. I'm in Wakefield, 599 North Avenue. Great. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Patel, uh, do you swear or affirm that the evidence you are about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. All right, please. And um, could I just confirm the police reports are in, rec in the record? Yes. So before I address the allegations, that are in the police report, I would like to tell you a little bit about Mr. Tarek Farrell, uh, Patel, I'm sorry. Um, he actually is the owner of the store, but it's a family-run store. Um, it's run by uh, essentially five employees. Um, my client is the primary employee during the week, and then uh, there's another relative by the name of Sohil, who is the primary employee during the weekends. Um, <coughs> Their parents um, work there as well uh, at times. Now, um, I know that there was a question about TIP certification. The main employees are both TIP certified, so Mr. Patel and Sohil Patel, uh, who are the main employees, are both TIP certified. Uh, it's a three year certification. It doesn't come up for renewal for a few months, I think, now. A few months. Um, so. Um, and we have those, I did not bring copies, but those are posted uh, in the office and we certainly could provide copies to the, uh, the board if necessary. Um, so Mr. Patel has owned this location for, or this store for th uh, three years, it'll be three years, uh, July 15th. And um, he's had about 14 years uh, background in the liquor industry. Um, there hasn't been any allegations against um, this particular location when, after my client had taken over, um, except the allegations that are made here tonight that uh, allegedly occurred in May on the 18th and the 31st, I believe it was. Um, Mr. Uh, Patel has security cameras installed, always have been installed. Um, as you heard from the police officer, uh, he was very cooperative when he was uh, asked if they could see the, uh, the video, and he did allow them to see the video. He wasn't able to copy it. I actually took a, uh, we got a screenshot of the, the uh, young lady that had come into the store on the 31st, and I actually blew it up and had copies made for the board, and I believe on the way over they probably slipped out of my file that's either sitting in my car or they're in Mr. Patel's office, but I can certainly provide them. But I thought it would be important for you to see what this person looked like, and this is the person that was described as a 20-year-old. Um, she was, in fact, 20 years old, and when you look at the, the photograph, um, it's not obvious, it wouldn't be obvious to anybody that she was uh, under the age of 21. Uh, in fact, you heard from the police officer, he said that the driver appeared to be a teenager, but he didn't say that the passenger who actually went in to purchase the alcohol <coughs> appeared to be a teenager or to be under the age of 21. So um, I think that's important to know. The, um, this is a, as you know, you know the store better than I do, but it's a somewhat of an anchor store. Um, Mr. Patel contributes to the community by the payment of taxes through his lease, um, and also he pays state tax as well. Um, um, they have had a policy of requesting identification um, from day one, and in fact, um, what you heard from the police department is that uh, there hasn't been any indication of any violation or alleged violation before this uh, occurred in May. Uh, in fact, uh, police had indicated that uh, that the ABCC does spot checks, and my client had told me he actually receives letters indicating that uh, they had come in and that he and they had passed. Um, and I expect that they send in younger individuals to see if they're carded, and they are carded. And what you did hear from the police officers, and it's also more, um, I think, more prevalent in the police reports, is that both of the individuals, the individual that was stopped uh, on, the, on the 18th of May, uh, had indicated that he had a fake ID and he had used his fake ID in the past. 
Um, and but he wasn't after that. He wasn't or at some point in time. He wasn't carded. Now we don't know how often he went in the store. We don't even know who this person is. The police reports that we received, and I don't know if yours are, but they redacted in terms of um, the identity of the person. So we don't know who this person was. So I don't know if it was a situation where the clerk may have known him from the prior identification, and and, and the person had come in so often um, that uh, that that's the reason why they weren't asked for identification. Um, in fact, I, I think one of the persons, I think um, the on May 31st, uh, no, I'm sorry, May 18th, the person indicated and the police officer testified that she had been going there for so long and using her ID, and those were the words the officer used, so, so, for so long they stopped asking for ID. So they did, in fact, card both these, pers these, these people, apparently not that night. But they had in the past, and they have a policy of carding. They've had that policy. They've been spot checked. They've been cleaned, and um, and, 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 and that's the that's the history that has been going on here. Now, there's no evidence that these people were so obviously underage that my client or the, the clerk knew, should have known that they were under the age of 21 or that they intentionally uh, sold alcohol to a person that they knew to be under the age of 21. And we don't think that the police report constitutes substantial evidence for you to make that finding. Um, with all of that said, I would like to say that um, my client, Mr. Patel here, did cooperate. Now we heard about this other individual, this other clerk. He was actually a family member and he was sort of just helping out a little bit. Like, again, it was a family-run business. He, he identified himself as a student, I believe, at Northeastern, and the, he seemed to be reluctant to show his identity, as you could see from the police report. I don't know if that was this, a matter of he might have been concerned. I don't think he has any immigration issues, but perhaps he may have been concerned about how that would affect his status as a student um, here, on, as, a, as a resident on, on a visa. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that we can draw an inference that he was trying to uh, elude the police in any way. Um, he seemed to fumble for his identification. He eventually gave his name. Uh, he, was, he was checked and nothing came back on him. Um, so he was an individual that was sort of helping out. Um, he had only been there for a sh very short period of time. Um, after this incident uh, happened, Mr. Patel terminated him. He's no longer working there, and I, I think he's no longer, in, is he it's still in the country? Uh, he, he moved to New York. Oh, he moved to New York. Um, so he's no longer in, involved at all. So um, my client had taken that step to, to, to address that issue. Um, you had heard that he actually volunteered to show the footage. Now, the footage rewrites after every 30 days. So, um, Mr. Patel tells me that he didn't, he wasn't aware that there was an allegation of an incident on May 18th. I don't know if the police were able to see the video on May 18th. We weren't able to see it because. He, when he got the notice of the two incidences, it, he indicates it was from the board, and that was in June. So the tape had re, uh, written itself, so we couldn't go back to look at it. And again, I don't know if the police were able to look at May 18th, but they were certainly offered to do that and welcome to do that. My client wasn't even present. Uh, he said, come back, and you can look at it whenever you want. He came back the next day. He was given the free reign of the office, and um, my client wasn't even present. So he was quite cooperative. My client was quite cooperative. Um, he certainly realizes the severity of the allegations here and the danger of selling to minors. But again, we don't believe that there's any evidence here that there was any intentional uh, act or intent to sell to a minor. Um, and uh, no evidence that these people were obviously um, under the age of 21. And again, I wish I had that photograph. And perhaps if you're interested, I could, I could see if it's in my title. It's, uh, it's in uh, Mr. Patel's office. Um, we would also like to tell you that 
After this incident, Mr. Patel uh, purchased a very expensive um, machine to uh, detect false identifications. And it, we have learned that both these individuals use false identifications in his store. Um, and I think that was the cause of the problem. And, and, and again, perhaps it was a situation where they were familiar with them. And again, we don't know. We don't know who was involved in May 18th. Um, we do know who was involved on the um, 31st, and we know that that, or at least I know that that person, um, and what you heard from the testimony, was 20 years old. And again, um, I'm not sure anybody could tell the difference between 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So um, again, um, no intent here. So he has purchased that machine, and uh, they are they have been using it since it's purchased, and they're using it. Um, religiously. Um, they also have uh, uh, a uh, written policy now, uh, which I do have copies for the board, which every, um, I don't know if you'd like me to pass them around or can I yes, put please. these into evidence perhaps? And So we have a written uh, policy now and the policy is that they are going to be uh, carding everyone that looks like they are under the age of 35. Um, and they will be again using the machine and all the any current employees have already signed that policy and they also um, any new employee will be required to sign the policy there will also be um, a as part of that policy that if that policy is violated that person will be terminated um, so um, those are some of the things that my client has put into place um, to prevent this from happening ag again. Um, and um, I, I think he would like to make a, a statement as well. Yeah, I'd like to make a short statement. Uh, I, I just want to let everyone know that, um, that I really do care uh, about our community, and it's particularly the, the, those that are under 21. Uh, I think that those under 21 represent our future. And you know, and that's why I have invested our time and energy, uh, basically training all of our employees and our staff, you know, on how we can prevent any kids under 21 from purchasing alcohol at our store. Uh, and that's also why we invested in, in this machine, uh, because we identified that really it's two things. It's like we, like we want to check IDs and we want to make sure that those IDs are valid. Uh, and, and we won't want to do that going forward, and, and we have been doing that in the past, but we, we really have spent the time to educate our employees on this. Thank you. Um, that's all. Um, does anyone on the board have questions for the licensee and his representative? I, go ahead. Uh, just one question. Um, in terms of, I uh, appreciate the, the new policy, um, in the past, how how have you dealt with the issue of number one, teams training, and number two, just a general policy that you expect of your employees, even if they're part-time? Uh, so uh, so when we started the store three years ago, I, I, I got tips training, and and Soul Hill, who's our main employee, he also got tips training as well. Um, and, and anyone that you know is working at our store, after several months, we would also give them tips training as well. Um, it, it just so happens that Soil and I are the main employees there. So, um, uh, in the past, like like it, it's just been him and I who have had the tips training. Right, so there are other uh, non-main employees that are involved in the operation. Now. Yes, it, uh, uh, my mom and my dad. Yes. And is that it? Are there others? Uh, so um, it, it's my mom, my dad, and my cousin. Uh, yeah. Thank you, John. Yeah, I've got several questions actually. Um, so it's safe to understand that there are two certified, two TIP certified employees, yet there's five employees that serve alcohol. True? Sure. That's correct. Okay. Um, do, you, do you remember when you got this license? Do you remember appearing yes, here? I do. Um, do you remember the conversation that we had? Yes, I do. Because um, I was the chair. Um, and I was very specific because we had had a series of problems with minors being served, not in this establishment, but in others. And we'd taken very, we take it very seriously. And you know, there were several things we let you know about. Um, 
One of them was that um, we felt that a strict policy of 100% of those people serving alcohol would be tip strained. And I know that I personally made that clear to you the day that we approved your license. And that there's just no question that that happened. Um, and so it's a little disturbing that, you know, you had employees serving alcohol that were not properly trained because this is what can happen, of course. Um, you know, um, so I, I guess the other question that comes to mind is, um, is there a reason that you haven't had the other people certified for TIPS training? Um, so I felt that, um, so I, I would say that, that there is no reason. Um, I felt that um, because I was a TIPS certified, because I was certified myself, I felt like I, I can train the, the employees and stuff. Um, yeah, that's all. Okay, so really there's, you know, not a reason other than the fact that you thought you could, you could provide the training necessary. Okay. Um, I think that's all I have for right now. Thank you, John. And Dan, any questions? I, um, I just want to make it clear that the student from Northeastern University was not he, helping out means he, he was working there. <coughs> yes, he yeah. was. He, yeah. he was so serving. he was an employee. Um, and were um, either of the two clerks tips trained that that night? No, no. And um, this is a, a, a question, perhaps, for the police. Um, if someone comes in with a fake ID, uh, is there a way for them to check on that ID if they're suspicious? Other than this machine they've purchased? Um, I'm not sure what type of training they receive. Yeah. That, but I think there's probably some case law with ABCC that even that machine doesn't exempt them from violation. Right. So I think there's more training in looking at the ID and knowing what a real ID looks like. And so the, the two are distinguishable. The, these fakes are not perfect replicas. Yeah, of a fakes can pass that machine and still be absolutely fake if you look at it or have someone else's picture on it or it could be somebody else's ID mm -hmm. totally and doesn't even look like the person person you know. So yeah. I, but that's more of a question of counsel, I think, for me. I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say that I'm pretty sure that there has been violations for people using the machine. May I comment on that? Please. In, in those two instances of the two questions, um, with regard to this other employee, he was a he was an employee. I don't even know if he was paid. He was a family member. He, he was the type of thing where he's hanging out. But yes, he was mm -hmm. serving alcohol. And then not trying to make an excuse, mm -hmm. but he wasn't a regular employee. He wasn't someone, uh, and I, I wasn't obviously involved at, with the tips. I don't know if it was a condition of the license. I have no doubt that that was something you made very clear, and I would assure you that Mr. Patel will now adhere to that uh, with his all his employees. But um, this individual, again, I just want to make clear that I, it's my understanding from what I've heard from the officers, it, he wasn't a regular employee and it wasn't someone that was going to be working there uh, regularly. Um, with respect to the machine, my client actually had did some research on it and he purchased the best machine that he could find uh, that was at least advertised as the most accurate. Um, but he also does know, to answer your question, that it is not 100% accurate so that uh, he, he is aware of that and he certainly will take that into consideration. He's not just going to rely on, uh, on, on the machine. So in that instance, um, you know, he might request a second formal ID or uh, use his judgment, um, but he, he, he understands that it's not flawless. But I, I think the advertisement is, what, 90%? Again, we don't know the reliability, but. John? So I've got a couple of, this raises a couple of issues for me that are very disturbing, frankly. You know, one is, you've indicated, Council, that um, 
this employee was in question was hanging around, you weren't sure he was even paid, and therefore this is some cause for us to think this is a, a dismissive type of problem. When in fact, you know, the sale of you know alcohol to a minor that could result in any number of horrible things happening, um, and the fact that you consider dismissing the act because we've got a part-time employee, a hanging around employee, an employee that doesn't necessarily get paid, is disturbing to me. Frankly, I mean, it's very disturbing to me that we dismiss in that way um, this kind of action. The other thing that I that I have a very important <coughs> question about is, it sounds like from your remarks, Council, that um, one of the big tests that's used in this establishment is how old somebody looks. That is a real problem for me. I, I will just tell you that. Um, you know, I, the fact that somebody looks a certain age or doesn't look a certain age is absolutely, yeah, if that's one of your criteria in the establishment for how you decide who to card and who not to card, it disturbs me, frankly. And, you know, I, I, look, I've been sitting in the same place in Fenway Park for many years. And when I sit there, the beer vendors have been serving beer all around me for that same amount of years. We know each other by name. If I buy a beer for the person that's sitting next to me, I get carded. Now I realize I look pretty young. <laughs> under 35. Yeah, under 35 probably. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, it, it's an established practice that people are, that their age is certified by the identification that they're carrying. The fact that you, you, you know, one of the litmus tests, it sounds like, um, you know, one of the rationales for why we should think lightly of this is this young woman looked 21. I, I don't know how you look that way, to be honest with you. Um, and I don't know that that's a fair rationale um, for, or if it is a criteria. Mr. Patel, I would ask you, is that a criteria in your establishment for who you card and who you don't card? Uh, what was written on the policy says under 35, but I think going forward we can change our policy, like to go to card everyone. Uh, you know, I, I'm not trying to wreck your business. I just don't don't get me wrong about this. But I think you have to have an established set of criteria that is. We try to make it bulletproof. It never is. Somebody can bring a fake ID in, of course. And if you look at a fake ID and you can't judge whether or not it's a fake ID or not, because I'm sure there's very good ones, and you serve them, fine. Somebody, you know, a, a relatively young person, whether they look 18, 21, 27, I, I, you know, I don't really care. So but the fact that we John, stop. Do we have any more questions for them before we I'm asking that question. I mean, is that your criteria? I'm interested to know if you're using the criteria of how somebody looks as to who gets carded and who doesn't. As stated on our policy, it says anyone who, who, who appears to be under the age of 35. Okay. So it, 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 right, right now, it is, it is not policy. But that's a, that's a new policy. And yeah, it, yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to explain. I wasn't trying to be dismissive in terms of this person. You had asked about TIPS training, and I was trying to explain that uh, perhaps that was a reason why he wasn't TIPS trained. But there were other people working there that weren't TIPS trained. And the other comment that I made about how a person looks, I I was referring to the standard of law that I understand it to be, and that is a knowing uh, service of alcohol to someone that you know to be under the age of 21. And that's the that's the section of the statute that we're here under, and that's been noticed under, and that's the reason I made that comment. Not that that's going to be the sole criteria, but that's that's it was not knowingly or intentional. Mm -hmm. If the person came in and looked like they were 13 years old, then it would be a criteria. Okay. Okay. 
And so my, my respectfully, my understanding of law is a bit different. There is a knowing component when it's sold to an intoxicated person. The server needs to have some type of knowledge that the individual that's acquiring the alcohol um, is intoxicated, but that same knowing standard isn't necessarily applied when it's sale to a minor. Um, there is a component when it's um, sting violation, you know, stings or undercover kind of um, investigations. The ABCC has found that you can't use someone that looks really old in that situation because it's unfair and deceptive in those cases. So there are some situations, um, but in general, um, you know, if someone comes in, um, they should be carded. Um, I have a question for you, Everett. Um, what is, is tips training or TAM training mm -hmm. required for every employee who sells alcohol? Mm -hmm. so, so it's not a state requirement. It's not incorporated into the ABCC's regulations <coughs> or into the Chapter 138, the state law, but it is a component of the Town of Reading's and the Board of Selectmen's policy. So it's Section 3.2.2.5 of the Select Board's policy that all managers, assistant managers, bouncers, bartenders, and employees permitted to sell or serve alcoholic beverages are required to successfully complete an approved program. And there is um, an ability for the licensee to come forward and say, you know, we don't want to follow tips or TAMs. We want to create our own policy. Um, and in that case, they would present it to the Select Board, and the Select Board can make a decision. So it's not just tips or TAMs, but they would have to come to the board and, you know, present okay. the plan they want to follow. Thank you. Other questions? A question for town, for town council. So the question before us is whether there's been a violation of this mm -hmm. section of the general law. Yeah. That's correct. And the, not um, the select board policy. Is that right? Correct. So um, my understanding is that we were unaware at the time that the individuals weren't trained. Mm -hmm. So at this point, this you can't find a violation at this time okay. that they violated this provision of your select board policies. That would need to happen through a notice hearing. Um, is there any requisite intent that we need to find to find a violation or is it strict liability? Is this what, like if this was like a jury instruction, would it be like, yeah. okay, we're, um, was, is the, is the question before us was alcohol sold to a minor? Is that the Correct. question? That's the question before you. Yeah. There's uh, differences when we're dealing with fake IDs, but as the uh, police officers testified, there was no, no one even asked for an ID in this instant. Um, and in terms of what level of evidence you're looking for, you're just looking for substantial evidence on the record. Okay. So would a reasonable mind, what would a reasonable person in this situation accept as adequate to show that a violation has occurred in this instance? Okay, thank you. May I comment briefly on that? Mm -hmm. um, again, the notice indicates that we're here for an alleged violation of Section 34, and I just would respectfully disagree with counsel. Um, very clear reading of that specifically talks about uh, it has to be intentional, it's not strict liability. It has to be intentional, it has to be knowingly. Um, and, and I would just ask the board to take a look at that section. I also would ask you to take a look at Cornwall versus um, Militello, a 2006 uh, case, um, which uh, actually interprets the statute and indicates that intentionally means a conscious act with the determination of mind to do an act in, in its contemplation rather than reflection, and it must precede the act as that word is used in the statute prohibiting a person from furnishing alcohol to minors, uh, and stating that furnish means to knowingly or intentionally supply, give, or provide. And there's other cases as well that interpret that. And so I, I don't believe it is a strict liability statute. I believe the case law supports that as well, and I'm happy to supply additional case law as well. And yeah, I'd like to comment on that, yeah. I apologize. It, it is not strict liability in this situation. Um, and that's where the 35 and under typically comes in is that, you know, the it's reasonable for someone to have to ask for 35 and over because it's hard to distinguish, as counsel said, between someone that's 19, 20, and 21. Um, but the fact is that the case law also says is that you should card those individuals. And if I may, um, what about counsel's assertion that um, there has to be intent? 
Yeah, so it does say in the statute that knowingly or intentionally, but again, we can focus on it int knowingly. Doesn't, you know, they're a little bit different there, and we can distinguish between the two. I would just focus again on whether there's substantial evidence in the record to support a finding. Substantial evidence that there was an intentional service of a minor, and in 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 the in counsel's correct, the the statute uses two words knowingly uh, or intentionally. In that case that I had cited, and again I can give you the actual site. It's uh, 66 Mass Appeals Court 325. Um, actually talks about the difference between knowingly or intentionally. Um, so, do we have any additional questions from the board? Last chance. Are we going to be um, thinking? So you're citing things, Council. Do we have copies of that? I can provide you the sole copy I have, or I can um, certainly make copies. I don't have a copy of the case. I have uh, e excerpts from the um, from this. Well, when we're bringing things into the record that you know we're going to try to opine on or decide about, then we should probably have that material, I, I would well, Then I would offer this, which has the case citation in the, um, in the, uh, in the, this here, did, did, am I correct, this hearing does not have to be resolved tonight? It can be continued? It can. Mm -hmm. It can be continued. Okay. I think it would be helpful to be able to review those, mm -hmm. those materials. Okay. So I, I do have a question. In that case, um, would the question of the select board policy then be appropriate to add if, the, if this is continuing versus closing it and opening another? Uh, you could continue this hearing. We could notice another hearing and then have that hearing open on the next night, provided that there's sufficient notice, meaning sufficient time between the two hearings. I, I, my concern is that we make sure that we're, we're looking at citing the right issues and the right violations. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not 100% sure that we are yet. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be in a situation where there's a problem that we're not able to address. I think that would be a mistake. Well, I, you know, our police department has done a good job bringing a, a situation mm -hmm. in front of us, and I thank them for that. Mm -hmm. um, we do have to get it right because whatever we end up deciding to do here should stick and it you know it sticks only if you have the right information and you know you, you follow the um follow everything going you have a question out there um if Second. i may i think the exact violation is a violation of the cmr code which is for the license premise itself and i think it's a different standard for the license premise than it is for the individual so it was noticed as section 34 sale mm -hmm. to um, a minor. So, okay. So our charge in both cases are a license violation, 204 CMR 205 section two, permitting an illegality on a license premise to wit, MGL 138 section 34. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what the mm -hmm. so what it, states in the notice, but those are the two charges that mm -hmm. put in. It sounds to me like we have some legal details that need to be ironed out before I, at least before I'm comfortable, and it sounds like a couple of the other board members, uh, before we make a decision on this. So, Mark, can I ask you, do, um, as a point of clarification, Bob, do we need a motion to continue? Yes, and I'd need to look at your uh, schedule. Um, <coughs> We have August 6th and August 27th. Can this be at any future meeting as opposed to the next meeting? Yeah, it just has to be to a, okay. a stated meeting. So Does it matter if uh, a full board is not present at a future meeting? No, because it's different than the zoning okay. matter. Okay. Um, I would recommend August 27th then. I think that would allow legal counsel to work with police. To identify and any other issues, board, and we would have a full board. Well, it also gives us an opportunity to, uh, you know, I mean, I think that we need to cite the fact that we have a certain requirement as the liquor commissioners relative to training, and that we haven't even addressed yet, and that gives mm -hmm. us ample time to notice. So, 
So, so what I'd like to recommend is that each, it, for any questions that you have pertaining to legalities of the matter, please forward them to town council so that she's able to address them mm -hmm. well in advance yes. of our meeting on August 27th. Right. Um, so good. if everyone could please do that by, what's today, uh, by the following Monday. And we can um, circulate a letter responding to those. Ray, can, Ray and I that's can work fine. on that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. The following uh, Monday, meaning the 15th? Yes. Okay. Yep. Madam Chairperson, would I have an opportunity to submit the, the cases that I have yes. cited? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Bob, would you yeah, like any, those to go to Anytime that night is open, so 8 o'clock is a simple motion to continue to August 27th okay. at 8 p.m. Mark, I have a motion to continue to August 27th. Can I ask Go. you a question before we make a motion? Of course. Um, and maybe it's part of the motion. I'd like to make sure that as part of the additional kind of evidence coming in that we're able to look at the all the appropriate regulations, not just this particular one that was cited. And if it involves other activities, to actually cite those and, and give notice about them so that we can have hopefully a hearing or a night and go through where the concerns are. Okay. Should that be part of the motion? I don't think so. That's just something we can ask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. we can work on that. Okay, so uh, move to continue uh, this hearing to date certain of August 27th, 2019. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? I think you want us to take time. Oh, uh, time. Uh, uh, do you have a preference? Yeah. Yeah. Eight o'clock is always easy. All right, let's do 8 p.m. Okay, motion to continue the hearing to August 27, 2019 at 8 p.m. Now do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Great. All right. Thank, thank you, Council. Thank, thank, thank you. Can I just say one other thing? I really want to thank you for the steps you're taking going forward, but we can't ignore what's happened. So I think, in, in fairness to everyone, you know, um, you know, the police who have worked hard to resolve a serious problem, and um, and you also, you know, you've employed counsel and you're trying to, you know, straighten some things out. And it would have been better if we did this three years ago, but here we are. So I want to thank you for that, and thank the police for what they're doing to help you solve the problem that you have in your business. It's just not good for your business, and they're actually have helped you. Um, in, in yeah, I think in a very obvious way and they certainly help the community as well. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. All right. Uh, so next up we have a vote to approve the Zani land acquisition. So Bob, I'll hand it to you. In your packet is a little bit of information. There were three sets of documents. Um, I know Mark has, um, I think you all have a set of motions. Um, there's just one set of documents we'd ask you to approve and sign, um, and that's an order of taking. And um, you know, we'd ask you to read each motion and vote on them, but the signatures are just on an order of taking. We've provided four copies, I'm not sure we're going to need four, but I just ask you to sign all three. For now. And this would complete the town's uh, transaction aside from actually paying the money. Which is, the, which is the last step. Is that on both pieces of property? Correct. Okay. So before we move to the motions, does anybody have any questions for Bob? Okay. Great. Mark, we can go through the first motion. Move that the select board accept the deed as presented. Is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor? Okay. Next one. Move that the select board execute the order of taking as presented. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Next. Move that the select board authorize town council and the town manager to act as agents for the town and to close on the property and to execute and record any additional documents necessary to effectuate the acquisition of the so-called Zani property located off Simon's Way. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Great. That was easy. Uh, next up, we have a vote for approval. Oh. Just if I could ask the board to sign those now, uh, town council will take them. Okay. Okay. So we'll just take a moment to do that. You can certainly vote for the next uh, agenda item. Okay, great. Uh, so next up, we have a vote to approve the affordable housing monitor agent. So Bob, I'll hand that to you as well. Um, does the board have any questions? Is the agent here? Yeah. So, uh, our new agent is here if you have any questions. Um, we presented in your packet the full uh, response to the RFQ. 
Mm -hmm. She's had had her answer any questions. It's certainly a very unfortunate circumstance and mm -hmm. prior age passing away. Does the board have any questions? As I understand, it's a very highly specialized field. <laughs> To a question, if I could. Um, this looks like it'll be one of the larger or largest uh, programs that you'd be administering. I'm just wondering, um, are you planning to staff up as a result of that? I know there are a couple of resumes in the back here, but this looks compared to the other ones that were that I saw in here. They're they're smaller numbers of portable units. Am I, am I right on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not fair. Just say your name. Yeah. Um, Lynn Sweet from LDS Consulting Group, LLC in uh, Newton, Massachusetts. Um, so at this point, because all of the units have actually been sold, um, really what our role is, is um, to monitor the units going forward and perform the resales. Um, all of our stra staff have been trained on um, uh, their uh, all of them are real estate brokers. We've all had training. I provide training on monitoring and lotteries. We just finished reviewing um, 10, 10 units um, in Medfield. There are four more coming. We did that in a matter of three, three days. Um, so I think the most important thing that I can do for my staff is make sure that they continue to be trained. Um, to oversee them, and um, to and I don't I don't see any problem with being able to respond to resales. I believe there have only been a handful of resales since the project was originally built, and that typically is um, the process. Um, and I did um, meet with um, with um, Julie um, and and Lori a few weeks ago when we spent a lot of time talking about process and um, turning the process over to our company and trying to have a written process in place so everybody knows what, what that process is, communicating with the existing owners um, and letting them know who we are if, if we're voted in um, and what our process will be. Um, the other time, so once a year we send out a certification where we ask various questions. Um, we are available for resale. Um, they get in touch with us if they're refinancing their property as well. Um, and we use that once a year check-in to check in on capital improvements. So we have, everything is electronic in our office at this point. We have a very large spreadsheet with all the units that we monitor. Um, we, everyone that works in my office can, can see that. Um, it's all cloud-based. So um, yes, you are absolutely correct that it is one of the larger portfolios that we'll, we will be taking over. But I feel that we have the um, ability to, to manage the process going forward. It, it's actually a very unusual portfolio to actually have 50 affordable units, which is terrific. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Mark, can I ask you to read the motion? Oops. Uh, move that the select board designate Lynn Sweet of LDS Consulting Group as the Town of Reading's monitoring agent. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Oh. Sorry, oh, yeah. Town of Reading's monitoring agent for Reading Woods. The Reading Woods 40-hour budget. Thank you. All right, try that one more time. Move that the select board designate Lynn Sweet of LDS Consulting Group as the Town of Reading's monitoring agent for Reading Woods 40R project. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Great. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. So next on the agenda, we have a vote to approve the train depot renovation. However, there have been developments. I believe I saw Jonathan. Yeah. Do you want to come up and just get a quick update sure. on where we stand? Thank you, Matt. Uh, I, I'm not sure if everybody saw the, the email that I had sent I think, to I think it just came to me. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I guess the bottom line is uh, that I had a conversation with Jeanette Cataldo, who is the uh, architect and the contractor for the project, um, whom I dealt with on the, on the previous part of the project um, and on this one as well. Uh, I spoke to her on Friday, July 5th. Um, and I'm not sure 
what she knew about the date. Uh, I did tell her that the date was, uh, the subsequent date was July 9th, but I then went over with her what the Historical Commission's position was, which was, as I think I mentioned last time, that um, we recommended the uh, retaining the, uh, the current historic colors, uh, but that we also had discussed at our last meeting an alternative option if the owner wanted to consider it of uh, doing an analysis, a chemical analysis of the exterior paint uh, in order to determine what other colors have uh, been used on that on that building over the hundred and some odd years uh, that it has been uh, in existence. Um, she then indicated that she would discuss that with the owner. Uh, she emailed me on Sunday uh, to let me know that the owner had decided to uh, go for the chemical analysis alternative uh, and that therefore um, he did not uh, plan to attend the meeting this evening. Um, to be clear, I had uh, mentioned to her that if that, if, if that alternative was selected by him that it would necessitate uh, the the uh, select board had recommended and asked that uh, that they consult with the historical commission um, in advance of coming to the select board so that it would uh, require uh, coming before the, the historical commission before going back to the select board um, and that I presumed uh, that there would not be a need for the owner to attend this evening um, so I I I don't know who else spoke to, to them, but I had suggested that it would likely not be necessary that I would take it upon myself to communicate to the select board of what we had discussed. So um, that would explain why they're not here, I assume, this evening. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that is where it stands, and I did then uh, confirm that in an email to, uh, to Jeanette that we would I would schedule it whenever they had the results of the analysis uh, for a historical commission meeting. I should also say that uh, I posted a meeting for the Historical Commission this evening, as I did the last time, um, but in my email communication to the Historical Commission, I also suggested that they may not feel compelled to come this evening. So uh, I did not think it was necessary to, uh, to open a meeting when I knew I wouldn't have a quorum. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, yes. So unless there are any questions. Thanks very much. So oh, I, I understood that they had some urgency on timing. Is that not no one has ever case? said anything to me. I didn't speak to the owner this time, uh, although I do. I have spoken to the owner and the owner's son, who actually has the business there. Um, and neither they nor Jeanette mentioned anything about any urgency on timing. So I, okay. I don't. I can't address that. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, Jonathan, thank you very much. Sure. There, there is no further action required of this board unless it comes up again. Okay. Thank you. Right. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. All right. So next we'll be reviewing some bylaw, zoning bylaw changes proposed for the November 2019 town meeting. So Julie is our community development director, part two. <laughs> We're so happy. <laughs> yes, indeed. Welcome yeah. back. Yeah. Um, I have copies of the most recent um, changes that I made today based on feedback received at the CPDC's meeting last night. Um, okay. If you'd like them, okay. they're not collated, so take one of each. Okay. Pile. Um, and I did not include CBD, so that yep. has not changed. There's one set. Oops. Another one set. Mm -hmm. So I'll try to keep this brief. Um, if you have detailed questions, please feel free to ask. Um, so we, sorry. Sorry. So we have four um, amendments that we that the CPDC is hoping to have on the town meeting warrant for November. To the first or second question. The first one is um, related to the definitions in our bylaw of marijuana and hemp. The second one is um, related to footnote one to the tables of uses. The third is regarding mixed use. And the fourth is regarding the intensity regulations which are in section six. So I'll just wait a minute until. Very good. Oh, wait, I'm missing out. 
What do you need? What do you need? You've got three items. Okay. Uh, yeah, three items. Three 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 Sorry. I should have collated them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. So, um, so before actually, sorry to interrupt, before you get started, um, to set expectations of what the board is being asked of tonight, um, are we being asked to review and approve these changes, or is it just for our information? Just for your information. Great, thank you. Thanks, In Jennifer. September, you'll be asked to close the warrant, and they will have gone through council with exact language. Perfect, thank you. Right. And so what I have in this presentation is a summary. Um, the actual content of the amendments are the, were in the handout, mm -hmm. and they're also on the website under CPDC um, town meeting amendments for 2019. Sorry, it's owning bylaw amendments for town meeting 2019. I'm kind of tired. It'll be in the okay. So the first one regards our definition of marijuana. Um, currently, the definition in the bylaw includes all parts of the plant. So, um, for example, like hemp and hemp derived products. So we, in essence, prohibit all aspects of the marijuana plant in town. Mm. Um, so it was suggested at one point earlier this year or late last year that we extract hemp from that definition and actually redefine marijuana and have a definition for hemp. Um, and the most recent um, proposal that we got from town council was just to strictly adopt the state's definitions of marijuana and hemp, um, which is in MGL chapter 94G. So I can go through them all and then have questions or one at a time, whichever way you prefer it. Why don't we go through it all? Or would you prefer it piecemeal? I prefer it piecemeal. All right. <laughs> so we can kind of talk about it at the point. I, I'm sure. fine with either. Go ahead, Joe. So the what was the impetus for this request to change? Um, that's a good question. It was the um, establishment of your CBD store on Main Street. They came to CPDC for a sign permit, and the question came up, do we allow this? So we looked into it okay, um, and yeah. discovered that we actually, technically, under the zoning ballot, do not allow it. OK, and it is CBD from hemp? Yes. OK. I believe it can also be derived from marijuana, but I'm not an expert on this topic. <laughs> so we didn't allow it, but we have the business. Right, because the discovery that we don't allow it kind of came after they had, they came, they, they entered into town without needing a building permit. Um, okay. And so knowing that this zoning bylaw amendment had been advertised and was on the table, we took the, the position that we would not shut them down until we just see how town meeting went. Um, Hmm. weighs in on the issue because we can allow it okay. if we change our definitions. Bob? It, it's the similar approach to how medical how marijuana came in, that it was a moratorium because it was advertised as a hearing for the future decision. Right. So this is similar construction, I guess. I mean, the business is over. We're not closing. We're instead trying to you know, amend the law so that it fits. Got it. So if this were to pass, would the business then have to close? So or would they be grandfathered in, so to speak? Um, well, that it gets a little more complicated given the recent um, policy statement from mm -hmm. the Department of Agricultural Resources. But I'll speak from a zoning standpoint. What this will do if it's adopted is it won't change the regulations for marijuana. It will simply change the definition of marijuana and it will add a definition for hemp. Um, but and it will not include regulations for hemp. So it will have we'll have two new definitions. Um, regulations for marijuana won't change and we won't have regulations for hemp, we'll just have a definition. So in essence it will be allowed under zoning. Um, so I have a question, if I may. Okay. Um, so if the convenience stores are selling derivatives of the same thing, which they are, um, this will kind of, I guess, blanket that as well? What do you mean? Well, I mean, so th there are derivatives of, um, of this particular substance that we have a store for that we're going to work on fixing the zoning laws so that 
it actually can stay open, correct? I yeah. believe that it would be able to stay open, yeah. open under zoning and then certain products, certain hemp derived products are approved for sale and certain ones are not. And so then it would be up to the Board of Health or some other entity of the town to take enforcement. Um, so are, so the, these products are like all over the place. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, they're in convenience stores, they're, I mean, they're everywhere. So I'm assuming, I mean, I don't know if we're looking the other way or are we just saying because we're in the process, we're leaving that alone. Is that, I do, I'm just trying to understand um, what we're doing. Um, these two very distinct and different pieces. One is zoning, which is all that's being discussed tonight at a town meeting. The okay. other part is, is more to health, let's just say, generally. And uh, my peers are struggling with that. It was a new definition that just came out, uh, I guess it's maybe three weeks now. It's a very common product. Yep. Um, depending on which town you talk to, which lawyer they talk to, it's banned, or maybe it isn't. So it's very confusing. Uh, this is the reason I'm raising and this. Is I understand. And this is only cleaning up the zone. If town meeting approves it's not it, really it's okay. cleaning up the It's not products. cleaning up the issue. Right. Exactly. Okay. That could be okay. a future discussion. And the Board of Health chair knows about it. They're not meeting for a while, but they're going to pick that up. Just as a point of curiosity, I know we're just talking about zoning. What is the what is our town position on the products? Are being sold and that's we don't have a position. No position we don't have a position therefore they're not you know acting out of correct you know okay but but the state has recently released some different guidance but from our CASA um, you know there is no position our CASA has because there's no medical information right related to the results yep so what I say? clear as mud all of it um, <laughs> so in reading your definitions and 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 the background to to them it appears that um, the marijuana definition applies to one subspecies of a plant and the hemp applies to a, a separate subspecies of the plant and the hemp is general generally um, much less psychoactive than marijuana? This is really not my area of yeah, expertise I, okay, ooh, okay. at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're, we're, yeah. But I, that think, was, I think we're drifting a little bit. Yeah, why don't we, right, why right, don't we right, let right, right. Julie go back to the presentation and read? Right. Thank you. <laughs> um, Let's not really make all I no, I didn't want to. I didn't this make is a summary of like my, my knowledge, the extent of my knowledge. Right yeah, here. I just wanted <laughs> to <laughs> point that out for the public that they're different. I think it's different parts of the same thing. I so I'm going to table okay. right. that yes. discussion <laughs> and hand it back to you. Go ahead. Yeah. So um, do you understand the outcome of the, it's adopted, the, um, for state definitions of marijuana and hemp are adopted? So we've gone through the materials, but for those watching at home and for those in the audience, why don't you give us a so brief. I'll just reiterate the outcome of the state definitions of marijuana and hemp per Mass General Law Chapter 94G are adopted. Um, we will have a new definition of marijuana, but the town's regulations about medical marijuana and recreational marijuana will not change. We will, and we will have a definition of hemp that will be in the bylaw, and hemp will technically be allowed under zoning. Um, if not adopted, then the current definition of marijuana remains effective. And as it includes all parts of the plant cannabis sativa, it will also prohibit hemp derived products. And as a point of clarification, this suggested change is being put forward by CPDC and with the support of the town staff. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Okay. Great. Uh, does the board have any questions uh, pertaining to this change in definition of marijuana as it pertains to the zoning bylaws? Thank you very much for coming in and not done yet. Okay. You're all set. It's it's more one. It's one. Oh, that's one. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> Buckle up. <laughs> Let's keep going. I'd like to say that's the easy one, but I'm. Now you're not so sure. So, sure. <laughs> um, there we go. so 
The second one is regarding footnote one to the table of uses. So footnote one is a provision that allows a single family home to be altered into a two family home if it meets certain conditions. Those conditions are that the home existed prior to 1942, which is when the town adopted zoning, and that at that time in 1942, it had eight principal habitable rooms, at least. So. A proponent would be allowed to alter a single family home into a two family home by right if they meet those conditions on the condition that they preserve the character of the single family home so that it does not look like a two family in a single family zoning district. This is a by right um, provision that we have been negotiating over the counter for a number of years in the public services office. It has, been, it has gotten very challenging. Um, as you can imagine, there are a number of homes in town that could that this could apply to um, and a number of creative proponents that um, have all sorts of different ideas about how this should be applied and what we should allow. So given that, um, there's been some talk about clarifying the footnote so that it, the intent, which we believe was to allow older, larger homes with you know, a large number of rooms to be converted into maybe two smaller units and not change, drastically change the character of a neighborhood um, was getting lost in some of the proposals that we were seeing. So this um, amendment would clarify the intent of the footnote um, by adding clarity to the parameters for the conversion process and then also make it by special permit by the zoning board so that it's not something the staff have to negotiate. Um, so it, it goes to the ZBA. Mm -hmm. um, is there any implication here for the Historical Commission? Um, and have they been, have staff or the commission itself been consulted for how they this They have not them? been specifically consulted. We can absolutely do that. The only, so, oh, if a home is demolished, it doesn't, this footnote no longer would apply to it. So, because it's not they prior have to 1940. Oversight over you know demolition delay for the homes and structures that are on their historic inventory. So, like we, uh, they absolutely would be involved if one of these homes was coming up for for a conversion or even just in general a demolition um, without a conversion. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. I have a Go quick ahead. question. I just, I'm a little confused by the, the timing here. Everything else is, makes, it's pretty clear, which is um, always good. Um, so it says, provided that the conversion does not increase, et cetera, et cetera, um, on the date of application for conversion or on January 1st, 2020, whichever is earlier. So just translate for me the significance of January 1st, 2020. Are we not allowing this after January 1st, 2020, or? No, um, I'm so confused. when we're establishing a requirement that a structure can't be increased by more than a thousand square feet, we need right. to set like a starting time period. So from that point forward, so someone could come in and add to it today um, but at the time of their application under this footnote, which yeah. could be, you know, if this goes to November town meeting, there's still some months left in the year. Right. So it could be that date or January 1st, 2020. Yeah. Um, okay. That would be the date that it's kind of, that structure is frozen in place at that time and then the thousand square feet gets added on after that. Okay. And I assume the ZBA has been consulted as far as what their new role would be in this process? We've started the conversation and we're actually having a meeting tomorrow um, with a representative of the zoning board to continue. Great. Um, so, okay. oh, Joe. Yeah. Um, so, I, I guess the only thing that concerns me about this is um, you've been able to, well, I, let me just clarify something. So, <clears throat> The way we've been doing this up till now has been over the counter. 
And so you have a home built in 1940. It's got eight rooms. They'd like to turn it into a two family instead of a one family and not substantially change its general appearance and match to the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, I mean, we've got a zoning. We, we have something in place that allows that to happen now. And that's been done over the counter. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to add a layer of outside government to this, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that what we're doing? Can yeah. I, I just got to, I, I, it sounds for like my own edification, yeah. why do, are we adding another layer that's going to cause more time and, you know, more consternation? I, I, I'm just wondering, you know, from a simplicity, I'm, I'm sure there's probably a good reason, so I'm looking for it. So, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, there's, there's, so there's two goals with this amendment. One is to clarify what is allowed um, in a way that will hopefully get back to the intent of what we think was the intent of this file. And then the other is to make it by special permit so that staff are not making subjective decisions about so what looks like are. a single family. <laughs> That's why you're there. Okay. So it sounds like it's in lieu of, right? So we're taking, the, the process still remains the same, except instead of the staff making that decision, now the ZBA makes the decision instead of the staff. Right. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. okay. my, my, oh, so, my question is similar to John's, um, but I'm just looking for a, a little bit more specificity. The language that existed you know, on its face seems really clear, but you had mentioned that there were kind of questionable applications that came forward that were putting town staff in a tricky position of having to interpret. And I was wondering if you could give, you know, what, what where, is, where has the ambiguity been? You know, are, like, what constitutes a, a, a finished inhabitable room? Is that the kind of, like, what, where, where was their confusion? Because it had seemed pretty right. simple as it had been previously drafted. So the conditions, um, the qualifications for this footnote, the eight finished and habitable principal rooms and the existing prior to 1942, that's the easy part. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. The hard part was the, t the word altered, for example. So um, town council had helped us on a number of different applications and one of the things he had advised was that when the house, when the original pre-1942 structure no longer ceases to exist, this footnote doesn't apply. Um, but we had some people coming in with alterations that more or less were proposing to take away all but one wall of the structure. Um, and, and everything from, you know, basically demolishing to, you know, keeping most of the house but adding more than 50% gross floor area on. So just having this enormous alteration. Um, there's a lot of gray area. There were a lot of different creative proposals um, and it started to get really squishy. And so we felt, since it's the creation of an additional unit, essentially, and the zoning board is already looking at accessory apartments, which is the creation of an additional unit, that this would be better situated under their jurisdiction. Any other questions? Mark? Briefly, with the, so there are two things here. One is that you've added some clarifying language, and two is attempted to say, let the ZBA deal with it from there. If you just had the clarifying language, how much would that improve the situation? If you didn't have the board, the ZBA involved, the state of staff, but you had the new language added on top. Um, I think it would be considerable. Um, I caution that there's always unintended consequences with zoning, and that even if I felt 100% confident today that this would take away all of our problems, there would be someone who would come in with a creative proposal that we would not know how to address. And it would be very challenging. So, um, any other questions before I move on to the next one? Um, so the third one is to add mixed use as an expressly permitted use in the business A and business C zoning districts. Business A. Um, and Business C are primarily um, down south Main Street. So it's the commercial corridor as you get south on Main Street. 
Um, right now in our bylaw, we, we allow multifamily and we allow business uses in um, the business A and business C districts. And we do not, we're silent on mixed use and we are silent on whether or not we allow multiple principal uses in one building. So it, it could be interpreted that we already allow mixed use. Um, that being said, the regulations around multifamily are very complicated and very, um, they disincentivize the creation of multifamily. So what we thought we would do CPDC um, is actually allow mixed use and incentivize and set parameters for what it is we actually want, um, as opposed to disincentivizing what we don't want. Is the disincentive still present? Right. So that's not going away. Um, the CPDC felt very strongly that we don't want South Main Street to turn all into, into entirely housing. It is one of our only commercial corridors in town. Um, so is this kind of a, um, an altered state 40R? So. I mean, if it is. Well, it's a good thought. Um, we have this discussion at CPDC. 40R prioritizes housing. Yeah. And that is not the intention of this. Okay. But from a de facto standpoint, what you're trying to do is incentivize mixed use. I mean, so right. it's doing two things. So it's not 40R because you don't want it to be all so much housing. Because you're right, it is the last commercial corridor that we really have that's open to commercial development. I mean, the idea of mixing it, though, is... And so this will accomplish that? Hopefully. Um, Except for those unintended consequences. Right. We've talked about <laughs> that's correct. That's why we're revising zoning every year. Um, but, so, this allows... Housing is, you know, driving market forces right now. So this allows a developer to more easily incorporate housing into a project on South Main Street while also making sure that you know, the first floor and the um, parts of the building that are fronting Main Street are still commercial. Um, is there a reason why... So, under Section 5-6.8.3, um, is there a reason why... Um, mixed use projects that have residential that we're keeping at a minimum of 10% of units shall be made affordable to uh, um, affordable units as opposed to say 15%? So, um, or 20%? I don't, you know, right. the, what's the reason, but what's the logic behind 10%? So 10%, the logic behind 10% is that as long as we have projects that are 10 units or more, we will keep on track with our subsidized housing inventory requirements. Um, it's an easily digestible number. Um, there's a certain sweet spot um, with affordable housing where if you're, if you're requiring too much, you're not going to get any development. It's a disincentive. They won't. They won't come. Do we know what we that? That number too big. Do we know what that number is? Not specifically. I have had a little bit of feedback from developers, and I've had um, a planner in a neighboring town did an extensive study of this, is including um, an affordable housing component in zoning is called inclusionary zoning. Um, so I have a lot of data about what works in different towns. Um, a large part of the equation is what the delta between a market rate and an affordable unit are in the specific town in the specific market area that you're looking at with regards to how easy it is for a developer to fit affordable housing into a pro forma. All affordable housing is built at a loss. So um, we, the CBDC um, and staff I think saw this as a starting point and to start the conversation and to keep us on track with our subsidized housing inventory. I mean, I, go ahead. Go so, I, I mean, I given our current situation, given the fact that the census is going to change our numbers, I mean, I, I would like to see that be higher. Um, we're obviously a popular place to build housing. Um, I don't want to create a disincentive, um, but if we can get more affordable housing units from developers, I, I would love to see that. 
um, I don't disagree with you, and we did try to include some flexibility, so there are a couple provisions in here to allow more flexibility in the design of a project if they provide broader or deeper affordability in the project. Um, because typically speaking, um, there is like a give and take. If you're going to require a certain percentage, you need to allow some bonuses or some waivers or some other design um, flexibility. Um, has CPDC taken up any discussion about um, having, as part of their parking, electric charging stations to be a requirement for any new developments? Especially since we're talking about combining potential um, uses. No, but as a driver of an electric vehicle, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to throw that out yes. for that consideration for yours. Um, some of the developments downtown, I believe that the Gould Street project yeah. is going to provide one. Mm -hmm. um, Solar might be a nice thing to throw in there. I mean, yeah, something reason. Yeah. Um, Julian, with the, the definition of affordable, um, there are two citations there. One is 80% of area median income, and the other is 50. Mm -hmm. Is there a standard definition of what affordable is? So units that qualify for the subsidized housing inventory are typically 80% um, or 50% under Chapter 40B. So, I mean, I don't want to get, I do know a lot about this, but I do not want to get in the weeds. Um, the is Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development, comes out every year with numbers, with income limits. Um, and then from those numbers, the 80% in, in this um, HUD area that we're in is derived. Um, so this would stay consistent with our current it, plans right. and current activities? This language it's not is different. No, it's, no it's very consistent. Yeah. Any other questions before we move on to the next one? Um, th this is to complement uh, John's concern that we keep this stretch of road uh, open for business and I did like how Julie it was um, they need to have enough room for a viable business and that was made clear in here um, so it couldn't be too re residential okay. Okay. next one sure um, so the next one is um, in some ways related to this one and then in some ways there's some other things that are included in it so um, section 5 and section 6 of the zoning bylaw kind of work together so when we changed section 5 it's, it was important for us to look at section 6 which is the intensity regulations and make sure that we're not having conflicts between section 5 and 6 so um, We aligned some of the, the paragraphs and requirements in Section 6 to match what we had proposed um, for, mi for mixed use. And then there are some other like edits that are fairly minor that um, will clarify some language that was omitted um, in another recent update that we did to this section. I think just it was to April 2018. The other thing that's important about Section 6 is that it includes the table of dimensional controls. So we added mixed use in there and then set um, parameters for um, yard requirements and setbacks. Any questions from the board? Quick question, if I could. Um, have you, you mentioned you talked to some other developers. Have you talked to some of the property owners on South Main just to kind of get a feel for is this a couple. accomplish what we think? So you have a couple. Okay. Um, I can't, I would never say that this will accomplish everything that they want, but it's a step in, I think, a direction they will appreciate. They will appreciate or they are appreciating? <laughs> did, did you get uh, good feedback from them? I have gotten good feedback. Okay, great. Thank you. By that you mean they they have a desire to have residential units as well as a commercial unit? Yes, that's correct. All right, thanks. 
Any other questions? Is that it? We have one more. Uh, I'm sorry, are you, are you uh, taking uh, uh, any comments or questions from, uh, from the public comment chair or, or no? Sure. Absolutely. Go ahead. Uh, is Stand this... and state your name. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Jonathan. Again. <laughs> Still Jonathan Clark. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, some might want that to change, but um, just a couple of, I haven't seen or, or uh, thought about any of this in until this now, and I, I appreciate um, the, the concept, so I don't, I don't have an opinion one way or the other, but a couple of questions came to mind. First on the, uh, the marijuana uh, and hemp um, differentiation. I'm just uh, curious. I know that, um, I mean, first of all, I know that the town, that town meeting uh, uh, voted to um, prohibit uh, all marijuana uses in town. Um, I don't necessarily support that. So, uh, but I don't know what the state, how the state views a differentiation between uh, hemp versus marijuana and whether or not uh, hemp is considered a part of marijuana. The reason I'm asking is um, I know that also under the state uh, law that uh, those towns or, or cities that allow for uh, marijuana type establishments or marijuana establishments can uh, get some revenue from those. I'm just curious whether, whether or not there's any impact with respect to uh, Hemp and whether the, the town has an opportunity to to get any revenue from that under under that under that state law and whether or not that conflicts with the position the town has already taken. Uh, that's that. And then with respect to the the mixed use uh, concept, it, it's a good concept um, as well. However, I, um, I know that in a sense, not only is it perhaps sort of a mini or or semi ODR extension, um, as select board member Halsey pointed out, but it's also conceivably an extension of the downtown smart growth district in terms of a concept of mixed use, which is which is great. However, I'm also aware um, and it's my personal opinion that, that those uses have significant impacts, uh, positive as well as adverse, on the existing uh, residential neighborhoods that abut them. I know specifically that was an issue, a significant issue, uh, with respect to the this downtown smart growth district uh, projects, uh, probably all of them. I'm familiar particularly with the Gould Street, but I think it's probably been the case with all of them. Um, I, I think it's in, incumbent on the town to consider uh, getting input from, plus all of South Main Street, uh, the businesses all border on extensive uh, historic, not necessarily historic with a, with a large age, but, but residential neighborhoods that have, that have existed, some of which are historic, um, have existed in town for a very long time. Um, all of this will have an impact or have a potential impact uh, not only with respect to the, the potential uh, expansion of commercial projects, um, possibly, uh, but also uh, the addition of uh, multifamily residential uses will also uh, have a significant impact on those neighborhoods. And I just urge the town to extend those neighborhoods an opportunity to participate and be heard in this process as well. Thank you. Thank you, John. That actually raises a great question. Um, Julie, how, how do, you, um, do you know how CPDC will involve neighbors in these changes, proposed changes? Um, we are currently having the pub in the midst of the public hearing process. Um, they haven't done, they're not required by statute to do outreach to neighbors um, so we haven't done any along the South Main Street corridor um, we have I have been in touch with some neighbors who are aware of some of the development projects that are um, you know have been proposed or, or may come down the, um, in the future and they are aware that we are looking at zoning um, so that is the extent currently I, I don't know how the rest of the board feels I mean I, I think that while it may not be required by statute or policy, if these changes are going to be affecting these particular neighborhoods, which it sounds like it will from a 
the town being a good neighbor as we consider implementing these changes, potentially at town meeting, it might be nice if there's an outreach effort um, to those abutters. So I'll throw that out there for consideration of CPDC and the staff and how they choose to handle. Yeah, I, I think it's a great idea. I think that um, what's also important is we know South Main Street is a priority corridor for activity, and I applaud the idea of trying to open up some options. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to hear from all, but I think we need to make sure that they're, we're providing some additional options, not, not trying to restrict further, because I think we won't get the development we're looking for if we do. Great. All right. Any other questions for Julie? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Um, why don't we take a five minute break before we jump to our next agenda item, which will be a hearing on various safety improvements in the town. So five minutes and we'll return.
Next up, we have um, a hearing to vote on various safety improvements. So, Mark, could I ask you to open the hearing? To the inhabitants of the town of Reading, please take notice that the select board of the town of Reading will hold a series of public hearings on July 9, 2019 at approximately 8.15 p.m. in the select board's meeting room, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Massachusetts, to enact Article 5.4.4.12. No person shall park a vehicle from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. Monday through Friday from August 25th through June 30th on any street or parts of the streets to which this article has been applied as listed under Article 12. Additional parking restrictions, 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. during school drop-off on Summer Avenue. Right turn only from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. on Oak Street. Amend Article 12 to replace 6.17 to 6.17.2. Northwest bound drivers on Pearl Street shall make a right turn only onto Main Street from the northerly terminus of Pearl Street by Mill Street. Restrict parking on Temple Street between 23 and 25 Temple. A copy of the proposed document regarding this topic is available in the Town Manager's Office, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Massachusetts, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., Tuesday from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m., and will be in the Select Board Packet on the website at www.readingma.gov. All interested parties are invited to attend the hearing or may submit their comments in writing or by email prior to 4 p.m. on July 9th. 2019 to town manager at ci.reading.ma.us by order of Robert W. Lalasher, town manager. Great. So, Bob, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks. Before I uh, ask the police to come up and uh, explain the details, I just want to sort of summarize what Mark read that there's three geographies in play here. One's Joshua Wheaton School. There's a few pieces of that one. Uh, one is Pearl Street in Maine. And then, um, uh, what was the last one? Temple Temple Street. Street. That's right, the bus That's going up Temple Street. Yeah. Oh, cool. um, right. So I think logically it makes sense to sort of proceed in three groups, if you will, to do all of the um, first one. Yeah. And just to point out in your packet, I, the schools asked if they should come. I didn't think it was necessary. I just want to call your attention to the memo from the principal, Lisa Marie uh, Ippolito, at uh, Joshua Eaton. Mm -hmm. And with that, I just like the police to come on up. Okay. Great. Thank you. This is the order of the right here. Um, sure, go ahead. Can you sure. Okay. Um, good evening. Uh, a few months ago, we asked you to vote on a couple changes at Josh or Eaton as the principal approached us um, that they were having a really hard time with drop-off in the morning. Um, so we came up with a few ideas of how to make that better, and um, you voted to let us have a 30-day temporary change on some of these. Um, and the principal likes everything that worked out. Um, we had no safety concerns, no residential concerns come about uh, with the changes that were implemented for the last month of school. Um, so the first one, we would need to um, vote on to just get an amendment to begin with on the no parking um, from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. Um, during the school year. So we don't have an amendment that covers that time. So that would be our first one that we would need to vote on. Okay. Um, secondly, then, if you vote to adopt that amendment, we would ask that you adopt it for Summer Ave um, in the front of the school as a drop-off only from 7.30 to 8.30. Um, I, another traffic and safety issue that they were having at Oak Street and Summer Ave is um, it is a one-way during that time and cars were coming down, passing other vehicles, dropping off students, creating two to three lanes on Oak Street. So um, we found that the safest thing to do is to make it a right turn only from that drop-off time, 7.30 to 8.30. I don't know if you want me to go on to the next street. Go ahead, run through them okay. and then we'll... Uh, the next one, we've been trying to go through the traffic rules and regulations to make sure everything is correct with our signage. Um, we found that at the end of Pearl Street here, um, on the north side of Main Street, the sign says right turn only. However, in the traffic rules and regs, it says um, left turn only. Um, sorry, no left turn. So that allows people to technically go straight across. The whole idea of the right turn only is because the sight lines are so poor, it's too dangerous to cross Main Street there. This is the Pearl Street Park that's at the base of Sanborn Hill, the big hill before you cross on North Reading. So yeah. cars coming southbound from North Reading into Reading, you're coming right down if cars are going across four lanes of traffic. Now coming off of Mill Street, 
it's a right turn only and the wording is correct that's a right turn only it doesn't say no left turn it says it's a right turn only the intent was when we did the intersection was have them both right turn only so again we're, just, we're going through just trying to clarify and clean up some language make sure the signs actually match with the language isn't there also a sign if you're on main street that prohibits a left turn on the yes pearl at that spot should be no coming southbound is yes oh maybe it's southbound it's northbound there should be southbound there should it be is, no left is, turn yeah. onto yeah on a pearl yeah, yeah. yeah. So right just we don't want anyone going over there yeah there was a sign there one no it is that. it's just there's not one going north to turn onto the mill though can you just confirm the cross street off of pearl so um the other one across the street this is one here is yeah. mill street so um, this is per, this is pearl at main that's what i'm yep. sorry right. thank you Pearl Main touches in two different locations, so this is the one at actually at Sam One Hill, across the street from Mill Street. Okay. Thank you. I thought you were going to do the same thing at that little turn up. Somebody so just asked, but we haven't. Because uh, it's it's a similar circumstance. Yeah, we haven't looked into that one yet, but we did it's just very get similar. that concern. Um, because there's room for one car. I think it's just because the sight line is so different. That's why it hasn't yeah. been done yet. But. Well, I don't want to distract this. This is. Um, and the last one is um, the resident that lives, it's hard to see, but he sent the resident that lives at this house has been um, saying that the buses, because cars are parking here and here in front of 23 and 25, they're driving over his lawn um, to pick up the kids. Um, and he sent us a video, it actually shows the bus driving right over his lawn. So I think the best thing to do, we would make no parking in front of number 25 and number three. And I would suggest all the time, not just during school hours, because the fire trucks are gonna have the same issues that a bus is having. So we have touch base with the fire department at one of the PTTF meetings and they agree that for the ladder truck and the engine it can make problems. And because Parker is not just during school times that you use the back field or as sometimes buses going through all the time. So we did put temporary no parking signs up and the residents, especially the ones having his lawn drug during the day were in favor. <coughs> Oh, the people at Talon Temple, 23 and 25? Uh, 25 is actually the person that brought the concern forward to us, so they're good with it. Um, and we have no... Because now there's no parking in front of their house. Right, <laughs> so they like yeah. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, and that's the five amendments for tonight. Okay. Any questions from the board? I would note that putting in these right turn only sometimes is an inconvenience for some some drivers but obviously the safety concerns I think outweigh that moreover um, the you know going down Oak Street going to uh, to cross summer or to take if you wanted to take a left turn onto summer there um, there's other ways to get to that end of summer from Oak um, so the drivers do have alternatives. And this was and that's what we at, yeah. yeah. And this yeah. is just from 7:30 to right. 8:30. Right. But right. if they're a, trying to get this yeah. train station, there are other routes that mm -hmm. people on Oak Street can take. Yes, and that is one of the factors, like Lieutenant said, that we do take into account when we're doing anything. Is are there other options available for people? Because right. we don't want to make it an inconvenience as well as a, a, and create a safety issue. We're trying to solve both. Just as a point of clarification here, as I'm looking at. The legal notice. Um, the very first one: No person shall park a vehicle from 7:30 a.m. to 8:30 a.m. on Monday through Friday, etc., since the school year, on any streets or parts of the streets to which this article has been applied, as listed under Article 12. Just for the public watching at home, for who might be watching this, can you just clarify what streets this is referring to? So uh, this will. You're going to vote this in as just an amendment, and then it would be applied right now. It's only going to be applied to Summer Ave. That's the second one you're voting. Mm -hmm. So anything, and from here on out, we could use this as an amendment to any street that we would ask that there be no pocket from 730 to 830. So it just goes in the front of the rules and regulations that defines what 5.4.4.12 is. And so all that will do is define that there's no parking from 730 a.m. to 830 a.m. And then the next one you're going to vote on will change Article 12, which in the rules and regulation is just a list of streets. Mm -hmm. And it will show that Summer App has okay. this enacted on it. Okay. Thank you. Everybody clear? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, so if there are no further questions, we can move to the motions. Don't we? It's public here. Oh, it's public here. I think we need to hear from people. Thank you for that. Uh, so we'll open it up to public comment on the suggested parking um, and lane restrictions. Okay, 
Great. So uh, let's close the hearing. Move that the board close the hearing on park parking, traffic, transportation, task force safety improvements. Second. All those in favor? Great. Move that the select board approve safety amendment 2019-7 as presented. Is there a second? Second. second. All in favor? Move that the select board approve safety amendment 2019-8 as presented. Is there a second? Second. second. All in favor? Move that the select board approve safety amendment 2019-9 as presented. Second. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Move that the select board approve safety, safety amendment 2019-10 as presented. Second. All in favor? Move that the select board approve safety amendment 2019-11 as presented. Second. All in favor? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Next up, we will be hearing from the town manager and town clerk, uh, Lord John, to talk about the fiscal year 20 election scheduling. Um, did you want me to discuss oh, uh, in one yes, or two sentences please. Haverhill Street? No, I apologize. Okay. Yes, please. I'm sure if anyone in the audience yeah. may have comments on it too. Yeah. 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 Um, so we um, slight change here. We will be giving an update on the Haverhill Street speed limit, um, and we will be allowing public comment. Um, after we hear the report from the town manager. Okay, thank you. Um, I wrote a rather lengthy explanation in your packet. I don't want to repeat that for the board, but just for the public's benefit. Uh, town staff visited MassDOT, uh, what is now a week or so ago, for two purposes. One was the paving of Main Street. Um, that will be divided into two parts. The first part will be Stoneham to the uh, train tracks and is purportedly going to start in August and somehow finish this construction season. I'm not sure how. And we'll have more of an update in August on the second part, which is the northern section. Um, then we broke into a smaller meeting to discuss specifically Haverhill Street and some other roads that are under the special regulation. Um, as I showed the board, they unearthed some 45-year-old document that showed that the then Board of Selectmen um, agreed to put a half dozen or so roads under the special uh, speed regulation. Um, West Street was the only one that the town has taken any action on since. For these roads, they have a very prescriptive process that's uh, both cumbersome and expensive, relatively expensive, to change the speed limit on, and the local uh, road commissioners, in this case the Board of Selectmen or Select Board, um, have no authority. Only the MassDOT, only the state through MassDOT does. So we are now engaged in, and I'm going to circle back to this, but we're now engaged with a consultant uh, at an expense we hadn't expected to provide MassDOT some data. MassDOT also made it very clear that not only do they have the final say on what the speed limits will be, that there are examples when people, when towns have come to them to request a lowering of the speed limit and they increase the speed limit. So they are the final arbiter and final decider of what that, what that will be. Um, <clears throat> needless to say, for anyone that knows me, uh, I'm not a big fan of government. I've worked for change within. Uh, that didn't really sit well with me that the town had no local say over something that was done 45 years ago when clearly the town was different. Um, so I engaged with our legislatures, as I know our chair did, and in speaking today to Representative Jones, um, he is most happy to go forward with an effort to return this to local control, um, to be decided how, but certainly the home rule petition is one option that he is willing to do. Um, I think the rest of the details of the discussion I had with him are really negotiating points, so I won't go over them, but um, one, one issue we will have is that in order to comply with MassDOT's rules and in order to do the speed study they want us to do, we have to change the speed limit signs tomorrow or soon, let's just say. And we had, uh, and, and we had no option, we agreed to do that. After talking to Representative Jones today, I'm less certain that that's 100% what we should do. So I, I've asked uh, Jane Kinsella, the DPW director, not to change the signs this week, to buy us a couple days where I could have another discussion with the representative because he thought it was a foolish idea to take the signs of 30 miles an hour town. But 
again, he's not MassDOT, he's a representative for all due respect. So I just want to uh, have another discussion with him. I, I said I would uh, get back to him after tonight's meeting, get a sense of the board, whether you have an appetite to either just go along with this quietly and see what happens, or whether you also want to try to have a plan B in the background in some way. And, and again, just to be clear, the, the plan B is not clear, but it most likely involves a home rule petition. You're all familiar with that process. Um, and it would um, perhaps address just Haverhill Street. That would be the cleanest way to do this, or it might address the other streets. So, Bob, mm -hmm. um, as we do have some neighbors of this area who mm -hmm. originally brought the speeding issue before us, can you clarify what a home rule petition is and sure. what it entails so that the public is aware of what that process will look like? A home rule petition is something that uh, every city and town in the Commonwealth has a right to go to Beacon Hill and petition, if you will, the legislature to have something done on their behalf that's contrary to state law. So certainly uh, not everything you want you would kind of get through home rule petition. Um, but for instance, um, we have senior tax relief that was accomplished this way. We were the third community in the state to have a version of senior tax relief. There was no mass general law we could have done to do it. So we asked them, please allow us to do this, and they did. Um, we've gone to the legislature, I've been here 14 years, maybe five times, and had successful home rule petitions. They have to be very carefully thought out, very carefully planned. There's a public participation component of it. Depending on what the home rule petition is, sometimes it has to go to the voters of the town at a, at a local election. Uh, marijuana, for instance, did go to the voters. So it is a way to step over state regulation and step law and state law, for instance. Um, and that is the only way I worked with council as soon as I had the meeting at MassDOT, and that's the only way we came up with that we can perhaps, and it's a big perhaps, sidestep MassDOT's rules. Um, I, I was a little surprised at how inflexible they were with something that was so old, but those are their rules. Um, and again, the, the specific people we were dealing with were in what's called District 4 in Arlington. They're very reasonable people. We actually get along with them well. They're flexible when they can be. They do not have any flexibility whatsoever. This is what MassDOT does, and they have no way to change it. So someone else has to tell MassDOT, this is what you're doing. So the board may or may not be successful in a home rule petition. Um, it's not common to effectively go up against a state agency, which this would do, uh, on a local issue. But if you're ever going to do it, you know, retaining control, local control over safety would seem to be a good reason to do it. But even if you choose to do it and the town supports it fully, there's no guarantee that Beacon Hill will pass this. It has to pass not just the local elected officials, but the entire body. So I've also reached, I reached out to our, um, to Representatives Jones and Haggerty, as well as um, Senator Jason Lewis. Um, I spoke with Senator Lewis, the Chief of Staff. He's also going to work, reach out to you and reach out um, to DOT. Um, they all, they, for those that responded, they did find it curious that we did not have local control over the speed limits on these roads. Um, I'm curious, Bob, from your conversations with them, is it, are they basing it strictly off of the decision that this board made 50, almost 50 years ago? Yes, entirely one document. Do we have any other background information as to why the board at that time would have ceded that kind of control to the state? I couldn't find any. I looked and there's no obvious reason that's listed under the minutes that are associated with the decision. Um, you know, one could speculate, but um, I really don't know. Um, I also don't know for West Street why MassDOT allowed such a lower speed limit because that's one of the roads that was similar uh, to Haverhill. It was in this SSR, or Special Speed Regulation, and that was done, I think it was in 1999. Do other towns have similar conditions with the state? I haven't asked. I have to assume that, that yes, they do. I don't know that it's common. I suspect that's not very common. Um, but, it's, but it's certainly interesting that the town of Reading has, I, you saw the handwritten note, um, five or six or seven roads. I'll ask my peers. I've not yet. Um, I've never heard of this until we ran into it with my limited experience. So what prompted um, the hearing or the discussion you had with MassDOT? Did they call you? 
or did we call them? Both. It's hard to know. It happens simultaneously. You know, this board has had uh, questions from residents and business folks about the speed limit being too low, and the su suggestion that we didn't follow some rule. Um, and uh, someone also contacted MassDOT directly. I don't know if it was the same people who contacted you or a different person. I don't even know if it was a Reading resident. Yeah. But as someone with knowledge of this topic said they didn't do this. Well, we had a, we had a lot of noise in the system from yes. non-residents yes. right, who use it as a pastor. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, and, and possibly West Street is a sleeping dog. Um, nobody has made the complaint. No, I, and that's I, think, the, you I know. think that one's okay. It went through a process as part, is it was done 15 years before the paving was done, or the West Street project, more than just paving. Um, and that was in, I think it was in the TIP, in a, in a state's capital plan for more than 10 years. So that was done thoughtfully many years ago. Um, we don't have any employees who currently were here when that happened, so we can't ask a lot of questions. But we do have some documentation. Um, West Street's okay. Uh, Is Haverhill. that the 99 material that we had in Yes. Okay. Haverhill and the other four or five smaller streets are still subject to this regulation. So, and Dan, I had a question. Yeah, um, a couple of things, Bob. Um, I'm, I'm sure I didn't hear you say you dislike government, given um, that we are all in town government. Um, but uh, that aside, um, did MassDOT give you any written, written documentation that um, they vetoed or denied the, the speed changes that we made? Um, in addition to what was in your packet, they did send a letter possibly to a few of us that said those words. So I, I don't think I put that in the packet because it wasn't received that day, but yes. They yeah. did. Could you circulate that to us so we were fu fully so, informed? Yeah. Could you repeat and that? Then, um, uh, the the other th the other thing I noticed that um, before we undertook this this um, plan to change the speed limit on um, Haverhill Street, Mass Dot Mass Dot has a uh, document out called Procedures for Speed Zoning on State Highways and Municipal <laughs> Roads. It's re it was revised 2017, and and it seems to. Um, apply to this very this very case. Um, did were we aware of this document and and that we were not following it? You're definitely asking the wrong person. I will say that we thought it was a regular road and we followed what the regular road would call for. Mm -hmm. So if that answers your question. Well, and on the Mass GIS, um, the Mass GIS website they. I am looking at a map where they do um, classify H Haverhill Street as a limited access highway. Um, that is, it is a mass DOT road. So um, either their GIS is incorrect or uh, it does appear to be one of their roads. It, it At least by this GIS map. Yeah, it is definitely not their road in the sense that Main Street is, mm -hmm. um, but that may indicate, this is like a footnote, that we should have in our policies. You know, right. There's yeah. something important about this road that's different. Yeah, I, I guess I'm saying that the, the letters from 1974, or the agreement from 1974 and 1999, um, I don't see how they're really applicable here if this, in fact, is 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 a DOT road, I'm not sure what you mean by it is a DOT road. I can I can tell you factually, it is owned by the town of Reading, not by Masta. Correct, um, but I, I'm, it j there seems to be a disconnect here between how the state the state seems to define this, at least by their GIS, as a as a DOT, a DOT road, and um, as such, it would seem we would seem to have to follow the procedures of of the DOT for setting speed limits. Well, that seems that's to be what you're saying that we have to do probably. for now, unless we go by way of a home rule petition to. Yeah, I would assume that's right. right. So, from a next steps mm -hmm. perspective, Bob, um, and then I'll open it up to the, to the residents. Um, 
what are our next steps? Are we waiting to hear back from our representatives? Are we waiting for additional negotiations with the DOT? Where are we? Um, when I left DOT, I assumed the next steps were to follow exactly what they told us to do, with no options. Just and take down the signs. To take down the signs, to put the new ones up, to conduct a study that takes four to six weeks, to send them the data, and then they would decide the outcome. Now, I had mentioned in my uh, uh, email to you or memo to you over the weekend that you know, home rule petition would, would be a conceivable way to return it to local control. I, I would have put um, odds at five or ten percent it would pass. After speaking to Representative Jones today, and again, I don't want to get ahead of myself with too many details, I'll, I'll see, I feel a little more confident that there's something to be done by the town uh, in conjunction with Mass DOT that starts with him. So the our next meeting is on August 6th, which seems right. a little premature, um, although if there's an update at that point, that would be appropriate to add a separate agenda item to that particular meeting for that update. Uh, if not, then let's have one, not necessarily as part of the town manager report, but as its own agenda item, so that way the residents can stay informed for our August 27th meeting. And if there's nothing to report there, then we can give that update and then move to September. I, I feel fairly conflicted that we told MassDOT we would do this after tonight. We said we have a meeting, I want to discuss this with the board, and then on the day after, we'll start to change it. I don't really think they're going to care whether it's tomorrow or Monday. Um, but with all due respect to anyone else who might have been put into this, such as Representative Jones, I don't know how I can not go ahead with doing what we told them we do. Um, can we ask but, them? But I will ask him if he has some magical power <laughs> where he can sort of get a stay on it. Well, well, it would be sort of go through our options, perform, go through the exercise. Um, what I don't want to do is with multiple time within exactly. a single year because that's going to be challenging both for the neighborhood. Right. Yeah, you know, the other thing that MassDOT said, and this was staff that was a little surprising, is um, their statistics and their data have suggested that speed limits make no difference. That people go whatever speed they are comfortable with unless you have 24 7 enforcement. So they take a different view of speed limits than perhaps we would. If we want to, to consider a home rule petition as something that we want to have as a, as a tool, then I would I'd recommend that we um, try to maintain a good relationship with MassDOT and not right. not not take down the signs because um, if, if we want if, if we want to have the option of going forward with a home rule petition. Um, and have the option of them not opposing that home rule petition. And we want to yeah. maintain a good relationship with them. I'm also, with them I'm also very sensitive to the fact they're in the middle of a five or six million dollar repaving project in town. Yeah. So yeah. that's their money, their state's money, mm -hmm. federal money, probably they're spending. That's why I just agreed to what they want. So I, I would like to have another discussion with Representative Jones, mm -hmm. just, just as an aside. Um, once we knew there was some question about that, this legally, um, the police have not given any money fines for speeding. You know, now, now that I've said that, everyone will speed. But <laughs> nonetheless, the no adverse uh, you know, impact on someone who's been driving under a speed limit that is posted is one thing, but now legally it should be another. So it's, qu it's quite a dilemma. Uh, you don't want to start changing speed limit signs uh, you know, every couple months. It will drive sure. people crazy. Never mind the cost of the inconvenience. It's not a big deal to us. It's just the wrong message to the drivers and the residents. Um, but in this case, it may come down to doing that. We may have to change it, let them do their study, have negotiations at the same time, and come mm -hmm. to some resolution. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, would, I would feel that it's wrong not to, at the very least, have another discussion with them very quickly yeah. and say, do you have any room to let us not change the speed limit and have a further discussion with you and then see where that goes. Um, I know, oh, go ahead, John, and then I'll open it up for a public comment. Yeah, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts here to what you've just discussed with us. You know, yeah, one of yeah. them is tied to what do you do tomorrow morning? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, yeah. what does Jane and her crew do? Do they take them down? Do they put them up? Do they leave them alone? I told mean, so, her not to do anything until next Okay, week. so that's sitting there. So that's right. one of the components of this. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like you've already had the discussion with Mass DOT, and they went, yeah, no. Right. Do what we tell you. Yes. We're in charge. Correct. And then they refer, they reference us to a 70, 1974 document. 
we've got a GIS that's actually supporting that. So whether one feeds yeah. off the other is, you know, is, is kind of almost a, a, a moot question. Yeah. But I mean, the reality is there is a legitimate document in place. They're in charge. Correct. It's their playground, and you they've been very clear with you about what you have to do. That's correct. So there's that. But then there's this, how about this part? And I support what you're saying. There's not anybody at MassDOT who lives in this town, who pays taxes in this town. Why is it, you know, when this is not a road that's a state designated road, other than by separate agreement from 50 years ago when there was a very different town here. Yeah. Um, I, the whole idea of the home rule petition is one that I think we need to move forward with with great vigor. Whether we've got the, the speed limit right at 30 or should it have been at 35 or should it, I mean, you know, there's that. Yeah. There's that question that needs to be talked about. Mm -hmm. Maybe, I'm not sure what the right answer is to that. But I, I am pretty sure, at least from my perspective, that we have an obligation to the citizens of this town to write, try to recapture control over a road that we pay for, we maintain, we own, um, that you know runs down the spine of our town. Uh, and I think if a home rule petition is the answer to that, I think we need to move it sounds like all three of our representatives are in an open discussion mode. I think we got to get on. That's where we have to get aggressive, in, in my opinion. Politely aggressive. <laughs> well, of course, um, always politely also aggressive. <laughs> the, um, the current administration uh, passed some measures to simplify local government, return some power to it, if you will, years ago. Yes. One of them is a 25 mile an hour speed limit right. throughout the town. Um, these roads are exempt from that. Stop to think about that. We, exactly. We visit. I mean, we entertained and engaged the current lieutenant governor in this room. You know, hearing about the return of right. local authority, and you know, one of those things is speed limits. And we've been hearing about speed limits. Boston is changing all their speed limits to 25. Yeah. So, so is Brookline. And here right. we are, can't control our own. Uh, we, I think we really need to be I aggressive. Think, I think we're in agreement on that one, John. Um, okay. So unless there's further questions for Bob from the board, I'm going to open it up for a comment. From, oh, and Mark, go ahead. Just a quick point. I think, I think your point's very well taken. I think we need to coordinate our efforts, though. It sounds like you've had a discussion with Representative Jones. You've had a discussion with Jones plus Haggerty plus Lewis. Plus Lewis. And we need to engage the the state government. MassDOT. MassDOT or frankly through the Lieutenant Governor Governor's office as well in terms of what's going on which goes to MassDOT. But we need to coordinate what we're doing. Not just kind of let it all go shoot down and see what happens. So I, I don't know who should coordinate that but it sounds like you know a meeting would make sense. I think it should go at full speed. And I think we kind of decide who's going to make the calls to whom and get it going. Okay. Yeah, it's hard to know which one voice to listen to. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, that's why six your voices are the same. Yeah, I, th I think I mean, I, can I speak for the board here and say we're all in agreement that this is yeah, yeah. not acceptable. So, okay, great. So from that perspective, then Mark, sorry, I'm, what are we all in agreement on? that we? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hear the moment. It's quarter of four. <laughs> that's, that's very late. Yep. Um, that we should move forward with an attempt to regain local control of our speed limits on these especially designated roads. Right. And perhaps starting with Haverhill Street and yeah. then exploring the broader options. Yeah. yeah, but we also have to resolve what to do and when with the signs. And it probably yes. is going to make sense to take them down. I think it probably is. Yeah. Um, so uh, what if we were, so Bob, if you're comfortable reaching back out to Mass DOT, yeah. figuring out what we're doing in the immediate term as far as the signs go so that Jane and her team can react mm -hmm. accordingly. Um, as far as the outreach efforts, Mark, I think your point is well taken. Do, uh, so Bob, in your experience, is this, would it be helpful and supportive to you in your efforts as we move forward with this with the reps to have one of us designated as a point of contact with the authority to speak for the board, um, either with state reps or with the state? 
Uh, that's really up to you. I, I would say that um, in the past, at least, that the reps would well, I would go to the reps and say the board has a unanimous sense of this and it doesn't require a vote, and that's okay. That's all they need. But you're certainly free to do other measures. There's no harm. Okay. Well, I mean, I've already reached out to them, and I know you have as well, at least with one. Um, so, so how does the rest of the board? I just have to say, I can't as, act as an agent of the board before the legislature. So I don't okay. know that I can really weigh in right. on that particular piece or be the person. I can't be the person going to the legislature on behalf of the board. Um, Okay. And, I, and, I, and I cannot be, uh, I cannot approach Mass DOT on this issue either because I'm a state. Mm -hmm. I'm thrilled to. But I am allowed to offer, I think I, I am allowed to, um, you know, guide it to a certain extent. And so okay. the, to, to the extent I'd, I'd offer some guidance, I would just make sure we continue to operate in good faith with all parties, including right. MassDOT, because we, you know, if, yeah. should the legislation move forward, we don't want there to be any word that we weren't acting in good faith. Right. Great. Okay. So I think it uh, makes I, sense what, what to, to have um, <coughs> the point person on this from the board. I think having the chair reach out to these legislature, uh, these, um, our, why can't I say Representative I mean, representatives. <laughs> I'm not getting enough wor uh, water in here. Um, I think it makes sense. I think um, it, it will drive home the point that the board through the chair is, is really concerned about this. So I would be fine um, with uh, allowing the chair to speak for the board in this matter. I have no conflicts, so if the board is comfortable with that, then I'm happy to coordinate directly with Bob on this. Great. Fine with that. Okay, fabulous. Um, so, so, to the neighbors who are here, sorry. Um, I know this is not exactly what you wanted to hear, but um, you're welcome to speak now if you have any other addi any additional comments. Good evening. And please introduce yourself, uh, provide your name and address. Sure, Kristen Coppas at 13 Hammer Neck Drive. Thanks. Um, so it was obviously disappointing to hear that this came up, um, but I have been communicating with Vanessa and thank you for your, all your prompt responses, even on a Friday night. I mean, thank you, it was really <laughs> nice. So I was going to suggest, and this is just a suggestion, I have a couple of topics too, but um, with respect to taking down the speed limit, so the statute, section 18, only says that you have to take them down at the direction of MassDOT. So I'm just wondering if the resolution is to take them down but not hook up, put up the new ones. Um, you know, put up back up the 35 and 40. That's just my potential suggestion on what we might be able to do. Um, and then I do have a question and I'm not sure about the mass GIS where it looks like Haverhill Street might be a, a state road, yeah. but the 1974 amendment, Reg 933, was enacted pursuant to Chapter 90, Section 18. So that's a local road, that's a road within the local authority right. that is one approved by the board. And then, yeah. I mean, if you were just reading that statute, it just sounds like, oh, we didn't go the next step to say, to get the stamp, the, the state approval to say it was within the public interest. So is that all we're missing or is there something else? Because Section 18, if, if we're just looking at that regulation, you know, it just seems like we could use the same statute, Section 18, the board approves it, now you go to the next one, and you just see if the registrar and the department will approve it as in the public interest. And I'm not, again, I'm not sure if, if the fact that you have it as a state road, if that is playing another factor, but it sounds like, at least since 1974, we, that was a local road, because Section 18 says it's a local road. Um, I'm certain it is still a local road. It might have different rules, but it's still our road. Um, I don't remember the chapters and verses of law, but a lot of what you just said, town council has discussed, and it is part of the solution. But if you step back a bit further, a bigger part of it right now is they want a different kind of traffic study done than the police did. Right. And that requires the old signs to go back up. So if we take the current ones down and don't put the old ones up, they can't do the traffic study according to their procedure. Mm -hmm. And I, I probably, I probably don't want to say this, but I probably support the higher speed limits for the purpose of that traffic study. But I am concerned that it may not even be accurate because people may continue to go 30 thinking that it's still 30. And just the utter confusion might not result in an accurate study. And then who knows what MassDOT will do. 
when is the study intended to be completed, the new study with the new requirements? Jane's still back there. Do you know Jane? It was supposed to stop. The reason I ask is that we are in the summer months and there are yeah. fewer cars. Mm -hmm. yep. So if the study were to be conducted, I feel like it would be more reflective of standard traffic or more standard traffic patterns if it were to take place in September when school is in session and there are more drivers on the road. Mm -hmm. Not that I want to extend the amount of time that we have the higher speed limits, right. but if it gets us better data. Well, interestingly enough, we, we raised that point because it also applies to Main Street in some other ways. And um, they said it made no difference when the study was done, mathematically. I don't see how that's logical, but again, we did ask. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I would point out um, MassDOT's take. I did a little. I read up a little bit on this on on uh, speed limits, and they, if I'm if I understand correctly, they assume that 85% uh, of the drivers drive at a safe speed. Um, that's the safe speed that they feel comfortable with. So, um, doing the study, as as Bob pointed out is risky um, because of people that's a that's an easy road to open up on and um, so if people feel comfortable opening up you know and driving a little faster um, they uh, they say that that speed is okay and it may not be for the safety of the residents but um, they 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 make that assumption that that drivers typically drive at a safe speed. Um, so. I think the, the neighbor who's got his car totaled would disagree. Uh, no, I, I totally agree. Disagree, but, but, but we have to understand where they're, you know, uh, right or wrong, that's where they're coming from, and, and uh, it may be a difficult. Uh, All right, Bob. Uh, Andy raises a, a really good point that maybe I should have mentioned because my head was exploding when, I, when they explained that to me that the faster people drive, the faster the road, the speed limit should be. That's mm -hmm. effectively what they said, which is what you just said. So yeah. the intrinsic you know, safety of the street is not an issue. It's, it's what do people feel like is a safe speed, mm -hmm. that's a safe speed, which is kind of what I said to you earlier, but he put it in much yeah. more defined terms, which just let me scratch in my head. And they only count the, you can only, if there's cars in the, in the chain, you can only count the first car, which, um, Presumably, they're setting the speed limit, and you can only count that one car. So it's yeah. fraught with. So, so perversely, if you want a lower speed limit, then people should drive slowly during the study. It's kind of totally counterintuitive. All right, so let's pause there. Um, I saw another hand raised. Yeah, um, I mean, to me that. Uh, sorry, of, name oh, and address. Yeah, Thank you. Lovely, I love it. Uh, 203 April Street, uh, which is across from Timberneck. Um, and that kind of underscores, at least, you know, we hear people say the faster people drive on your street. Well, I've had three cars in my uh, in my front yard in the last four years. Um, wow. I can't cross the street to take my kids to school. They go to kill a mile, you know, less than a half mile away. Um, my dog was hit while on a leash as I crossed the road uh, five years ago. I mean, it's, it's 40 miles an hour for a fully loaded uh, cement truck coming from Wilmington. It is, it, you can't stop, it, it defies the laws of physics. Um, same with the lumber truck coming from North Ray, or one of those big lynch you know, trucks coming from Wilmington as well. These, these are people who are taking advantage of our roads and putting, putting people's lives and property in danger. Um, and I, you know, the charming map coming from the state kind of underscores the reason maybe, maybe we should, in my opinion, be as humble as it is, uh, but as a resident of the taxpayer, we move forward with the, the home petition. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay. I'm Elizabeth Gomez Street, and um, I wanted to say that I'm really disappointed. Obviously, like everybody else said, thank you to the board for um, trying to move forward, take control of our roads. Um, but mostly, I wanted to say that. Sorry. Um, so the DOT isn't doing very well right now, right, because of that whole incident with the drivers and the motorists that happened. I think that they would want to take more of an initiative to go the safer route. Um, this is just kind of saying that, you know, 
speed limits are not suggestions. Google Maps has um, the app says you know the speed limit for the road. Um, so it definitely speed limit signs are respected, and um, I just don't think. Um, Yeah. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Well, if there's no other public comment, I have a quick question. I know it's only been a short time, but have you folks felt any yeah. difference? Yeah, especially. Yeah. Yeah. You have? Yeah. Well, it's not perfect, but. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, um, have ammunition. Yeah. Um, so there's a question. There is one. Kristen, I, oh, there's another question. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I'm Thank you. Kristen Swartz, Chief Radio Industry. I also have concern. I know that their way of looking at the study is very different from the study that uh, our police department conducted, but I also have concerns with doing it during the summer because I think the volume will be very much down. I don't know if then that works in our favor because of those traffic and people can go faster. But I mean, I agree. Walking to school, crossing the street is nearly impossible. Like backing out of the driveway, that's something we knew when we moved here. But walking with our children to school is really challenging, and it has been much easier with it's slower because even if it's just one car that follows the speed limit, it allows us that time. So I'm not. I'm not saying that. What we can do would be helpful, and I agree with moving forward with the petition. I think all of the neighbors we've spoken to are in favor of, I think, can use all signs. Okay. I'm not defending what the DOT puts out, <laughs> but we have to be aware of it. Yeah, yeah. I know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so we'll, we'll close this down. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, we will, Bob and I will continue to work. We'll provide an update as soon as we can, most likely at our August 27th meeting. Um, but in the meantime, we'll be in touch if anything else develops. Thank you very much. All right, um, so now we will move on to uh, the fiscal year election schedule, and we'll be hearing from our town clerk, Lord Jim. Thank you, Laura. You can turn the usual time drive up here. Um, is it any cooler outside? No, I looked. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Maybe we can fire that fan up. It's toasty warm in here. Yeah. Does the air shut off at a certain time? Yeah. This is above. Um, Can we change that? If, no, he knows we're here, so it shouldn't. <laughs> okay. It is a new fiscal year, so we have to be careful. Seriously, can we turn the fan on? Is that, oh, a, is that a bad idea? No, yeah. Ask. Caitlin, is it, would it be possible to turn on that fan in the back just to... I'll do it's, it. it's loud. Me. What was that? It's loud. You could turn on this right here. It's cool, but it's not freezing. Uh, okay. I think that will be still an improvement. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I didn't realize they were. Let's do that first. Bob, did you want to? Uh, no, Laura's here to discuss uh, elections, whether to combine them or leave them separate. Perfect. She right. provided you some additional information in this packet mm -hmm. compared to before what other towns do. Um, you know, feel free to start asking questions. Mm -hmm. So why don't we let Laura go through the presentation in its entirety, um, and then we can ask her questions. So um, I didn't necessarily prepare a presentation, but I just had the document that was put in your packet. Um, as I stated, I sent out a notice to the uh, email group of all the 351 towns. Mm -hmm. um, I had 32 respond back, and of the 32, 27 said no. Um, that they will not consider. Some of them were a little interesting in their language on why, how they were saying no. Um, two have said they were thinking about it, but I wanted to point out that those two are new clerks and have never run a presidential uh, primary. Um, so I'd be interested in seeing what they have to say afterwards if they choose to. And one um, uh, said they had never really thought about it. And another one said it was a great idea, but again, that was another new clerk, too. So you know, the, the response is definitely pretty much no. Um, any questions from the board for Laura? 
So, um, partially a question, partially a statement, but I'll try to make sure there's a question that goes with it too. Um, I appreciate that there's more effort that's involved in doing it. Um, and also the fact that not everyone is doing it, I think, as a bonus, because to get extra election workers, you don't have as much competition. Um, but I was looking at places like Lexington, um, which actually is similar in size to, to what we are in terms of the, the election. I, was, I didn't realize that, but you know, it's nine precincts, 22,000 voters. Um, I, my biggest concern is to make sure that we're not let me do it the other way. We're, it's great when we have great turnout for elections. I don't, want, I don't want to do something that controverts that. And in looking at some of the responses, I know that there are a number of people that said, hmm, interesting idea. I want to kind of see what this is. They may be new people, but, but that's okay, too. Um, aside from the logistical complexity, um, are there really, you know, is there anything that kind of says, geez, this is not, not something we would want to do? Um, I'd like to just point out that, so Reading is actually one of the um, creative, I guess you'd say, communities. We've been combining the election since 1984, as we pointed out, yep. which, you know, um, it, as you saw in some of the response, not a whole lot of town clerks actually thought about doing that. Um, so, but the, but at the time, as mentioned earlier, when you're talking about the streets, Reading was a different town, right? We, you know, we're really increasing in our voters. So when you're looking at the logistics of it, combining this one, you're, we're going to be dealing with five ballots. There's four ballots for the state, for the presidential primary, and then the local. So you're dealing with five five different ballots being fed through that machine, five different ballots that are going to have to be dealt with every, at night, and then and then um, you're dealing with uh, a very busy day of a lot of people coming through trying to decide which one of those ballots are going to be fighting, you know, dealing with. You're also dealing with voters that are coming in and they want to vote and get out. When you hand them two ballots, a lot of them decide I'm not going to vote. I, and they just either leave the ballot in the in the booth. And so you're not necessarily increasing as much as you think you would be increasing, is my point. Um, because they're not going to take the time to vote two different ballots. Especially if they try to take the Democrat ballot, they're going to, if they have the, that ballot is going to be quite long, not picking out any particular one of the parties, but that ballot is going to be quite lengthy. So they're going to look at that, they're going to say, I have 10 minutes here, I'm, I'm out of here, and then the local ballot's going to be left. So with that said, state laws, um, election law says that we only can allow them 15 minutes to vote. Oh, really? So you have a 15 minute time limit, which we've never enforced. But when you're looking at a, a busy presidential primary and you have a line and you have a 15 minute time limit, then we're going to start having to throw people out of the you know, boost to keep, keep that line moving. It's, so that's what I'm looking at is in the amount of voters that we have coming through with the limitation. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. It's I, kind I, of a lengthy answer, but yeah, did no, I answer no, no, your no, question? No, no, it's very helpful. I, I, um, I'm not sure that where you have the possibility of getting a 50 plus percent turnout, the number of people that say I'm only going to vote one ballot is a third of the total, which is probably what would happen if we had a second election. 40 percent in the last. Well, we have election. we have the, yeah. the data. 40 percent delta. Together. The data is here, yeah. and in many years. Um, in 2012, it was 24 and 24 percent for both town and state. Yeah. Right. So, so it looks like people did both ballots there. In the previous year, there was a four, you know, 54 to 50 for uh, uh, both the most current one. Uh, primary. That's and the anomaly. Percentage. That's the interesting thing. But in most cases here, it looks like people, Reading residents filled out both the the town. A uh, ballot and the, the primary, and and even when they didn't in in 2016, it went from about 52 percent to 34 and a half. 
34 and a half only filling out the town. Um, that's a much bigger turnout than we ever see. In in um, so I I appreciate the logistical concerns. Um, I'm just pointing out that it doesn't seem that in previous years too many people have only have, have just left that town ballot and aside. Uh -huh. um, five ballots? Can you? I, I'm I'm. I'm, th I'm thinking of three. What are the other? It's um, for for this particular. So the, the if, we, if we combine, what would the right, five ballots um, be? Democrat, Republican, the um, Green Rainbow, uh -huh, uh -huh. and help me out with the Libertarian. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And, then and town, one. and then right, and then a, then okay. the town one. So the the pri when you're running a primary. That uh, the primary parties that can hold, I'm sorry, the parties that can hold the primary changes every two years because uh, it goes by the numbers of the um, at the registered voters. Correct. Um, I have a couple other questions. I noticed that some other clerks had mentioned that the Secretary of the Commonwealth discourages combining elections, and I didn't know if you had any direct guidance from that office about what's recommended. So they discourage it um, because of the logistics. And I have, I did have a conversation with Michelle Tesnari about it. She's aware that we've been doing it since yeah. 1984, and she's, um, they, they will not tell us that we can't do it. Mm -hmm. They just don't like the idea. Um, they also are aware that we've run it very well, you know, up until now, and you know they're aware. Um, Michelle has no issue with us doing it. Okay. Um, until something goes wrong. Yeah, exactly. But she's she's aware of how I run the elections. She's been here on election day, on a very busy election day, and you know, so she's witnessed on how we run the elections. Will that become an issue? But as Bob said, not until something happens. Mark and then Bob. To close, um, back to the, the ballot question. Even though there are five ballots, there are only two per person that will go through the machine. Correct. Right, because you'll pick one party plus the, the local. Correct, but so, the machine has to be programmed to handle all five ballots. Got it. So one of my questions is, um, how many machines do we have? <laughs> so do we have any backups and things like that? Or can we rent backups? So current... Currently, we own nine. We have in possession 12. I love it. Don't ask, don't ask, don't ask questions. <laughs> uh, so I think, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about here is that, you know, we've done it historically and we've done it well. It has improved voter turnout, which is something we always strive for in local elections. I think if we're considering <coughs> separating them, um, I would be disinclined to do it for this election. I would be more inclined to combine them for this election. And if separating them is the direction we want to go in, then perhaps what we could do from that perspective is look towards the next presidential election where if we, I believe, Bob, you stated that the first April in, or the first Tuesday in April is the local election due to the charter. Uh, perhaps it's time that we revisit that for a Saturday in May. Many of our peer communities have their local elections after the Springtown meeting, um, and that would put a two-month space between the presidential primary, roughly, and the local election. So I feel like if we're pursuing the option of separating them, I think that keeping them one month apart is going to have a negative impact on voter turnout for the local election a month later. I know that it would be problematic for me to do that. So I have to assume that it's going to be challenging for others to do it as well. It's, it's tough. To, to vote twice in a, in a month? It's tough. That's a, that's it's a challenge? tough to make time to vote. We have an 18% voter turnout on a good year for a local election. So clearly, 82% of the population don't make it out. Well, I would argue that that's apathy, not time. I mean, perhaps, even, you know, I mean, but well, as a working parent, it is challenging to make the time to go vote. So, and there's a lot of working individuals here. So, and I have to assume that's a deterrent, especially on something like a Tuesday. There are towns that have moved to a Saturday, which I think would be a great idea. So, mm -hmm. um, and I, regardless of whether we do it, um, one or two elections this year, one or two in 2024, I do think 
that it's worth having a conversation and perhaps it's for a later agenda item about ways the town can work to increase civic engagement and voter turnout, whether that's looking at um, Saturday elections, whether that's allowing for um, like r robo calls, the, the likes of which we use for Reading 375 or road closures to let people know in advance of when we have an upcoming election, which we've heard um, from some residents by email about. Um, I think maybe this could be a future agenda item. And, and I, I understand that you know every four years, if we tie it to a, uh, a presidential primary, that's a bit of an artificial way to to boost um, to boost turnout. It's not something that's sustainable for every local election. So I think if we could look at some some options for for doing that in a in a sustainable way, that would be that would be great. Thanks, Greta. Yeah. <coughs> so I just wanted to point out a couple of things. <clears throat> One, an answer to um, Mark's question on um, the logistics of it is we we are we're at about an eighty percent chance that we're going to have early voting for the primary. Mm -hmm. So that means that during for early voting, what that hap how that works is folks come in, vote their ballot, goes into an envelope. We have to then on a day of election go through and feed those ballots into the machines in between people coming in. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at two ballots being fed. Um, so if we have, let's say, 2,000 people come in and vote, and that's a very low bald number, um, we have 4,000 ballots that have to be fed through those machines in between voters coming in. Um, that's going to create a little bit of an issue. The other thing I wanted to bring out and mention is that the, so the way that the bylaw is written currently is that it, the election is the third Tuesday preceding the fourth Monday. So it can be the first or the second Tuesday is what I want to just bring in there. But what the main thing I wanted to point out is that the only reason why we can combine the two is because it states in the, in the general bylaw that we can. Otherwise, mass law would not allow us to. So the bylaw was written in such a way that said that the that you as the select board could um, change the date. So, and that's something that the AG's office approved way back when, back in when the bylaw was originally written. Um, they may not now, exactly. Well, I just wanted to kind of follow up on the things you both said. Um, not to say that just because others do it, we should at all, but. That's the reason why 27 said they don't do it, is because they can't. And the logistical reason why most of my peers can't do it and why they explained it to me is their elections are after their town meetings, possibly as the last article on Saturday, for instance. Um, so they don't want to do an early election. Their elections typically May. They don't want to do it in February or March. It serves them no purpose. For us, it, it has historically served a logical purpose of they're four weeks apart, let's just do it this way. For most towns, that logic is very different. Um, and it, as I sat in on the charter committee, we did discuss all this, and they just were adamant that they liked the way the logistical flow was of town meeting welcoming in possibly a third new member as your board, possibly you know two new members uh, before a town meeting, which is not the way most towns do it. So it has it was discussed. Uh, I noticed several of the clerks had expressed concern about an increase in costs by combining elections and I was wondering um, Laura if your analysis is still that there would be a slight savings to combining the election um, yes so I'm not sure where they're coming from in an increase of costs except for um, the increase in, in election staff that's the only place that there would be increasing cost. Mm -hmm. The part that would mm -hmm. would decrease the cost between the two is um, the DPW staff doing the setup. We'd only be paying it once instead of twice. Okay. And then um, the police detail. If we're combining it, we're going to need more police detail. So that's going to, I mean, in, in you know, mm -hmm. so typically I have four officers at a, every election. Mm -hmm. um, so you're looking at, it, if it's on two different days, eight officers that need to be paid for, whereas if we combine it, we're going to probably need six officers for the set. Make sense? So you're going to save some money that way. Mm -hmm. um, 
Other, I mean, and I'm guessing not every clerk pays for or cares about the two things you just mentioned. Correct. They only have a narrow view of what the election costs them. Mm -hmm. Correct. It sounds like the difference, the, the cost difference is marginal. Uh, I would, I would agree. Mm -hmm. It's about nine thousand dollars. I mean, that's not even a rounding error in a hundred million dollar budget. No, but when we talk about you know wanting to be fiscally prudent, this is a way of doing that. It's a small cost well, savings, but that's funding that could be. You know, used. there's a lot of other, there's a lot of things that you know we haven't discussed here. I mean, we've heard from the person in charge that you know uh, her recommendation is that we keep them separated. We've heard from one of her senior members in a letter that same thing. That's the people that do this are telling us that this is probably not a great idea. Just because we've been doing it since 1988 doesn't mean it's necessarily a great idea. There's some other, you know, unintended consequences of this. I mean, as our elections in this, I mean, I think we have to look at trends that come up. So, for example, we can look at 2000 and say that there was a marginal difference between the town election and the presidential election. But in 2016, there was a 40 percent difference. I mean, it was substantial. And yet the local voter so for that, for the would local it be election possible for me to finish? twice. You're right. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, and so one of the other considerations is that what has gone on in the election cycle in this town is that it has continued to back up. So, you know, with an election on April 2nd, April 3rd, April 4th, whatever it is, you've now been putting papers out mm -hmm. by demand mm -hmm. in, I mean, almost right after Thanksgiving. Correct. Okay, so we back it up another month. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're gonna be in an election cycle while we're busy trying to get the budget done, you know, as a, as a board, of, as a as a select board, I just think that you know, for a whole lot of practical reasons, and you know, the one I just mentioned is not is not a small one. I mean, to extend the election cycle to back it up further into the budget season, I think is not wise. Um, I I just feel like the. The idea of having a local election when we have it may be where the problem is. Maybe it should be in May. Maybe it should be on Saturday. I don't disagree with that, Vanessa. You know I don't. Um, I actually have thought for a long time it made no sense to introduce new board members um, and, and new members to town meeting when they were trying to get business done and didn't have any idea what was going on even. I mean, the, the idea of having your town meeting and then electing new people seemed to make a whole lot more sense to me. So I, I concur with that idea. And I think that we're going down a path here that's in direct defiance of what our paid professionals are telling us, which is to separate them, leave them separate. And, and I personally will vote in favor of having separate elections. Uh, on those two days. So, um, I have the, as you know, I have the utmost respect for the town clerk. Um, and I understand that this will be a, a big undertaking as they have in the past. Um, that said, two, two things. One, John, to your comment that there is a trend um, because 2016, there was a lower percentage of people who used the town ballot. That's only one point in, in many, and I, I don't think we can call that a trend. In either event, um, it's, it's the number of people who come out and vote in these combined elections that gets Reading a much more uh, greater participatory democracy, and and I think that's the that should be a top priority of any government. Um, that the most most voices are heard, and I'm in favor of exploring Anne's ideas um, in the future of, of increasing voter turnout for local elections. Okay. Um, so, I, if we were to co if we are, if we were or are to combine, I understand that would be a, a huge administrative undertaking, um, and 
it would require recruitment of a lot more volunteers. And I was wondering um, the process that you've do undertaken in the past to do that, if you're concerned. It, I, I think you were concerned that it would be difficult to do that this year more so than in years past. And I was wondering um, if you needed additional support or resources to do that, undertake that kind of recruitment. Well, it's my intention to ask the select board if you choose to combine them for your help in mm -hmm. recruiting. Yes, um, yes. I think so my concern with it, my concern is that a lot of the um, election staff go to Florida um, and they're still there for the April election. They definitely will still be there for the March election. So mm -hmm. that's where the concern comes in is that, you know, most of them, um, are not around. So the other area that, you know, if we recruit a ton of new election staff, which in the past we've always done but via uh, word of mouth yeah. um, mm -hmm. or, or mailings and advertisement in the paper, et cetera, um, then we have to look at training time too. So right. we would have to start the recruitment now. That's right. part of the yeah. reason for doing this early. Um, so that we can start doing the training sessions and and I can start spending the time that it's going to take to train. What kind of training um, is required for new election workers? For, uh, election staff are required to go through training um, once a year. Okay. There's no okay. other than that. That's the only limitation that there is. You know, only requirements that's there. I'm required to go through every six months, but the the um, the training that I'm required to go through is through the state. The election staff is required to go through training with me once a year. Mm -hmm. And but if you have and and with with that said, the majority of the election staff have been with us for years. Mm -hmm. You know, so they they, you know, it's just a matter of refresher. If we start recruiting a um, a, a new staff, it's going to take a lot more training, and it's going to take you know, um, probably them coming in twice four hours each okay. for me to really get them up to speed. Okay. That's going to be the main um, factor in making mm -hmm. sure that this doesn't end up being organized chaos. And did you have training. to do that four years ago? Was it a, Did you have to recruit a lot of new um, election workers four years ago? Um, I would say, yeah, we, yeah. yeah. I mean, did I do a, did I do the training to the extent that I should have four years ago? No, that was a learning experience that we definitely have to spend more time with training. Um, and then in this, the summertime currently is the best time to do that. But then again, there's not a whole lot of people in town. Right, right. And is the, the what what is kind of new this cycle is the likelihood of early voting. What, I'm sorry? The, what is what is new this cycle, the likelihood of early voting for for town elections and the additional step required for that? Other than early voting, the, the um, so typically we usually only have two ballots for the primary. Mm -hmm. So this time we have four. Okay. Um, the early voting. And then also, over the last four years experienced voters or election, election staff. staff. Okay. Um, the election staff are, for the most part is retired folks so they are, don't want to do it anymore. You, you're thinking that there's a early voting? Is that what you're saying? Yes. If that happens, will you have to accommodate early voting for the town election as well? Correct. Will you be able to do that in this little room? So the plan is whether or not we have early voting for the local election as well. Uh, my, I'm revamping my plan a little bit. So we're still going to use that room. We're still going to have that room set up. We're going to have it set up so that the traffic flow is where they come in. Because um, I don't know if you remember the presidential back in November, the way the traffic flow was going in and out. It was yeah. kind of quite crowded. So now it's going to be that the traffic flow will be they'll come in. Um, then they'll vote and then they're going to come out this door and this room will be an overflow so if, as, as we start getting busier we'll start having some ballots in here as well so that there's not as that's not as crowded we're going to do that whether or not we have the local or not um, so this will be during the day early voting and at night we'll 
tear it down and Right, so this room is offline, if you will, for a period of time. This one can be open for night meetings. Including the the um, cameras? The, um, no, they should be okay. So then, in other words, they just shut down, button up, and then open the back election. up at night? Yeah. What happens to, so, so this will be a whole new thing, too. Yeah. I mean, we've never had early voting as part of the town election. Correct. Um, how, how do we sit with that? I mean, is that... Is it legal? Well, the, the way that the law is written is if there is a local election combined on the day of, uh, on the same day as a election where there's early voting, we have to do it. That makes sense. You can't make yeah. people come back twice. I, I would hope not. Yeah. I mean, um, so I, I want to recognize that I appreciate sort of the extra strain that this would put on staff from an organizational perspective. Um, and if we move forward with combined election, then I think we as a board need to make sure that we are fully in support of our town clerk um, to make it a reality and to make her successful in it. Um, as for the issue of combining or not, you know, I think that towns notoriously struggle with low voter turnout and I think this is a way to get people more engaged um, and to your point I think we should absolutely put on a future agenda ways to pursue um, increasing voter turnout that's sort of a separate item but for the issue at hand which is whether to combine or not I'm leaning towards combining them I think getting more people involved in voting matters Mark you've been I'm characteristically quiet. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I kind of made my points early on. Um, I think it's important that we encourage as many people as possible to vote. And I'm, I'm appreciative of, of the logistical challenge. Of the, you know, it's 49 more people. Although, I mean, when um, in 2016, how many people did we need? Did we have? And, and I'm trying to figure out how many, how many new people do you have to recruit? And it's, it's large. The question is, how large? Um, I, see, that, that question is hard to answer mm -hmm. um, because, so, t a typical election, I send, I have a list of um, election staff that's kind of like on my, my active list, which consists of just over 200 people. So just before, about a month before an election, maybe six weeks before, I send out a letter asking them about their availability. They return back telling me when they're available. Um, I then create a schedule back 100 and sick about that but it and then I create a schedule I purposely schedule probably 20 more people than I need and I generally end up with on election day about 10 people short because I because they once they what because once I send back the letter saying you're scheduled to work this day at this time I start again in calls and they start dropping like flies kind of thing yep. Um, yep. So, I mean, I mean, in principle, I'm very much in favor of having one election to maximize the turnout. Um, but I also appreciate the logistical difficulty, of just making sure that you know the people have enough support to get it done. So, um, you know, if we were planning to vote, I, I would vote in favor of one election. I, I, Vanessa, I would just add, I think that I see this as an opportunity to get more people involved in the voting process as, um, as trained, um, you know, registrars for, for, for voting. Um, and also get a younger crowd um, in there if possible so that, you know, we have them for many years. And, you know, once people get a little taste of town government, it can be, uh, <laughs> Oh my God! I'd like to see see <laughs> you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, if, if you know, I think every meeting from now on, we need to be pu pushing for uh, encouraging people to apply, and um, th so that gives you some um, relief. Yeah. So I have to just say, if, if 
any of you are interested in working the polls, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have four people ready to do it. Yes. We so to as long as your name, it. yeah. <laughs> I think you have four people that ought to do it. <laughs> we got a couple of letters, too. I, I think there are five people that ought to do it. <laughs> uh, I disagree. <laughs> Regardless of whether or not the elections are combined. All right. Um, so uh, is everybody comfortable moving forward with the motion? Uh, yes. I just, I, yes, I just want to um, reflect what some others has, have said, which is um, acknowledging the administrative burden that this imposes and um, personally committing to work on helping to recruit more um, election workers. Thank you. All right, so Mark, do I have a motion to combine? Sorry, fall behind. Uh, move that the select board combine the local election and the presidential primary in March 2020. Do we have, just before we have a second on that, do we have an exact date in March on that? Third. Third. March 3rd. All right, can we amend yeah. that, Mark? Move that the select board combine the local election and the presidential primary on March 3rd, 2020. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. All right. Um, Laura, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Come back to us. We're trying to work with okay. the schools and see if we can encourage so, some student participation. But the trouble is, that they have to be 18 to register. Um, they have to be 18 if they want to get paid. So they can volunteer if they're underage? Correct. Oh, but they get paid. If they're 18. If they're 18. More, more importantly, they get fed. And they mm. get fed. Oh, that gets fed. important. Okay. Do we have um, input into the menu or? Uh, <laughs> or it does a good job there. <laughs> they get fed well. Yes, they do. Okay. Great. So thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. All right. So next up, we have um, potentially to change the language forming the ad hoc. Um, Human Rights Committee. Uh, so I'm going to hand this over to Andy and Ann. Um, why don't I give the history? Of okay. The, 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 and then, um, so as you know, uh, last November, uh, the then select board voted to create an ad hoc committee for a human rights board. And we discussed um, who should be on that ad hoc committee to give us the proper um, breadth of, of input from various parties. And that was really our focus when we set up the ad hoc. Um, then Vanessa and Barry went and, and followed the um, instructions of the board to s set up such an ad hoc committee uh, with those representatives. And um, then in, in uh, March, I believe, of this year, the, the previous board um, cemented that language in our, in our policy. Um, and it was, it was reviewed by, our policies were reviewed by town council. Um, when Ann and I came on board, um, were appointed to the ad hoc, um, questions were raised about having non-residents, uh, there were two at the time, um, on the ad hoc committee. Um, however, uh, so, so we then tried to see if we could get back in line with the words of the charter. Um, and that's proven tricky. Um, so I will, and, and uh, yeah. So with that, I think I'll pass it over to Anne. Anne made some attempts to. Um, sure. So I um, had reached out to town council to f um, figure out a way forward with a, f a few objectives in mind, um, allowing for an inclusive process, allowing for the participation of those who had been appointed. Um, uh, allowing for the select board to ha continue with a role on the ad hoc and um, 
um, making sure that we were we were squarely within within the charter. Um, and uh, Ray had com Ray came up with a proposal that I feel feel comfortable with. Uh, I think Andy would prefer a different approach, and so we thought we would get seek feedback from our board, our, our fellow board members, about what direction um, you'd like us to proceed as we're as we're hoping to get uh, move forward with some new language or structure for the for the ad hoc. Um, so the proposal that Ray had suggested um, is one where we could vote as a, as a select board to dissolve the ad hoc committee effective immediately, but then it could be reconstituted under the auspices of the town manager with existing members intact, um, but it wouldn't be a formal committee of of the town, but it would allow the participation of the non-residents who were previously appointed. Um, and and Ray could work with us to draft the mission and charge so it would still be subject to the open meeting law be, um, to allow for transparency and accountability. And we could have um, we could have the select board members uh, who would be appointed could serve as chairs. Um, and oh, we, we another piece that I had asked Ray about was uh, allowing for the for the membership possibly to be expanded uh, to so that we could so that there could be some additional members specifically Reading Public School students. Um, there was an interest on the ad hoc in inviting um, some Reading Public School students to be part of the process. Um, so that was. Um, Ray's proposal, and I, I endorse it um, as one. I think that would allow the different objectives to be met. Um, but I know that Andy had a different view, and so we thought we'd bring it uh, to to our fellow board members. And Andy, had door A, door B, yeah, <laughs> um, something like that. So, so I, I did a lot of um, thinking about this over this over the past weekend, um, and and I. I hearken back to um, t September in 2017 where we appointed some Board of Health members um, in not um, in keeping with the charter and at the time um, Town Council advised us that um, they were still you know appointed they're still members um, if we, and that there are no legal consequences for um, not following the charter. Um, I'm a fan of the charter, I, I and I'm a, I'm not a fan of opening it up boards, committees, and commissions to non-residents. Um, however, I think in this case, uh, number number one, I think we need. We're, we're talking about the superintendent who has taken a leave. And we're talking about a Met co-parent, and I think given the challenges that the ad hoc is trying to address, um, we need, you know, we would greatly benefit from uh, a Met co uh, representative. Furthermore, we, the board voted to appoint uh, these members as full members, and um, to turn around. So, so I think that that's it's the best thing. It's really the best solution for Reading is to keep these members on the board, so we get a broader perspective, one that may not be available from uh, uh, residents of the community. Um, but also, I think we appointed um, this Metco parent and the superintendent, um, and then to turn around. Uh, and, and say, well, um, you're no longer you're no longer invited to be on the ad hoc or this select board's ad hoc, which was our, you know, we uh, put a lot of work into putting together this ad hoc. It was a very long evening, if you you'll recall, and the board supported it, and um, we appointed these people, I think, now to turn around and say, um, we missed something or we didn't take something into account, um, you're no longer, you can no longer be a full member of this ad hoc, uh, I, I, th I think is 
the wrong the wrong thing to do. And keep in, and lastly I'll say keep in mind that this is one non resident on a, a, a ad hoc committee of it, probably 15 or maybe more depending on the number of students that we add. So it's not like it's going to be um, non-residents will drive the process. They, they will help us form and they will be full members and, and they will have a, the, the person will have a seat at the table. I think that's the, the right thing to do. I'm sorry, what, what's the proposal that we would do? It, keep it as is and even though it's not completely kosher inside the charter, just go straight ahead? Yeah, yeah we, 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 we made that call. Okay. And, and, and then the proposal would be, I think Ann and I recognize some, we, we'd have to go back and look at the, look at the language again um, with my reflections in mind. And I, I would, I think that we should keep uh, the members that we appointed as voting members. And I think that um, uh, we would have to rewrite the language to add in some students that were requested and um, to add, um, and I think that's it, right? And add some student. Most, I think the, the one other piece is to make sure that the language um, of, of, of appointment reflects our existing memberships because it doesn't, it's a little bit, it, it, right. it could. Oh, right. <laughs> it, that's right. That's um, right. You're right. But to be clear, um, I do not endorse uninviting people who are already participating. Um, and I think that Andy and I have sim a similar vision in terms of how this group would operate, but we have a difference of opinion as to um, the legal structure and um, and I guess just my pri being interested in prioritizing that we're operating within the four walls of the charter is particularly given some of the input we've received from residents about concerns about membership on boards, commissions, and committees in town. So I, I do have a few comments about this. One of them is the current complexion of that, the makeup of that committee was never vetted through the VAST process and was not approved by the board. It was appointed by the two people that um, were, were dispatched as select board members. And that was fine. We said, go ahead. So let's be sure we're clear. I mean, it wasn't as though we had to ask, we had a vote of the board. We did have the, a vote of the we board. We did have a vote of the board. I, I, okay. I, I could be, co Bear, I could stand corrected, yeah. but yeah. Um, you know, or I, I don't sit. recall it, yeah. but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. I guess what I, where I'm really driving though is, I agree that you shouldn't uninvite somebody. Mm -hmm. And I agree that a Metco parent, um, whoever, that a Metco slot, fits mm -hmm. and you have a current parent who's actively interested and involved and that's great um, <clears throat> you know at one point you had you know the superintendent of the schools who's a non-resident right now the solution I think that has been suggested by Ray and I believe endorsed by Ann is elegant yes. in my opinion mm -hmm. I mean it doesn't uninvite anybody it opens the doors to students it opens the door to the, the to the medco parent in question that person should not be uninvited that person should not be a you know a less than member uh, mm -hmm. at all yeah, yeah. Uh, you know the idea that bob could run such a committee that you know the two of you could co-chair it I, to me i think it's just an elegant solution i mean i think that you you kind of solve all the problems. It's not a you know. It's not like the the board is disavowing it. You know, we're looking for ways for it to work so that you can actually have minutes and vote on them because you know who's voting. I mean, and things like that. I just I, and then now we get semantically it, it moves forward because it sounds like you guys are on one page about kind of mission and yeah absolutely and so yes, forth. yes yes so why don't we uncomplicate this 
and you know, let's disentangle it from a from a charter call <laughs> because there's going to be one. I guarantee you, as we're sitting here, there's going to be there's always a person who doesn't like how the speed limit signs are, or who doesn't like that they perceive the charter being violated, or that somebody sees a policy being. Look, that's just the way it is now. So I really think the solution that Ray has offered and that Ann has endorsed really kind of follows the path, Andy, of what you want to do. And I think that I, I just, I personally think that's a better way to do it. So yeah. Marco, uh, I, just a moment. Um, John, to address your question of whether or not we, as a full board appointed, we did on March 12th, 2019, we appointed all of the members of the ad hoc committee. Okay. Yeah. In, in, in violation of the charter. If I, if I may res respond uh, about that. Uh, so, but yes. Yes. I think. Um, the, the reason I, I disagree with Anne on, on, on the, that, that approach is, is twofold. Um, one, I think it's, I don't think it is consistent with the setup of our government, our town government, to have uh, the select, a select board ad hoc or select board members um, serve under the town manager. In, on, on a uh, entity that is run by the town manager but co-chaired by the, the select board members. I think this should be a select board ad hoc, as, a, as is in our policy currently. So um, if we want to change that, we would have to have a hearing and get rid of the ad hoc um, language. Um, secondly, um, I, I see... Uh, uh, an inconsistency here. Back in 2017, there was a, a, you know, people did bring up that this was, that the appointments to the Board of Health were not done um, in a consistent manner with the Charter. And um, the Board decided to stick with those appointments. In fact, Town Council said that if you want to change it, you'll have to have a hearing to remove them. So why that answer then? for a, a charter challenge, and yet now we have a change of tune. Thank you, Andy. Mark? So in the, the Ray proposed structure, um, I, I'm a little concerned with the kind of who, who, who's on what. It, can it be in his structure that Bob sponsors the group? I'm confused between who runs the group and who chairs the group. Does chairs the group mean that they control the agenda and, and focus, or is that the person who runs it? I, I, I don't want to get caught up in language. I, I don't want a structure that is just untenable. Before we sort of go down that mm -hmm. rabbit hole, um, I, I, while Ray's proposal does technically address the charter issue. My concern is that it raises another a transparency issue, which is that we as the board attempted to create a committee. We did create a committee mm -hmm. ad hoc. Um, and because we faced obstacles in the composition that we created, we're sort of using a back door to keep what we're doing. It feels disingenuous to me to use the town manager as a workaround. Um, you know, I, I want to be sensitive to the requirements of the charter. I mean, I'm going to be frank, and neither of these options are very appealing to me. Um, but I dislike the idea of working around a public process because even if as part of the mission and language in the creation of something under the town manager says we will follow this procedure there is legally nothing requiring it to abide by open meeting law standards so I, that part of it makes me a little bit uncomfortable so aside from the technicalities of how it would be run and who owns it um, it, it doesn't seem like honest government. Bob? 
<coughs> Ann asked uh, Andy and, and myself for opinions on the on her option, if you will. I can't remember a month or so ago, and I said I'd do whatever it took to help. Um, but I was assured uh, by Ann that it would be structured in such a way that it would effectively act the same way, that it would be required to uh, follow open meeting law, uh, that you would vote on the wording of the new policy or committee format or whatever, that if you will, it is perhaps a technicality that it's under the town manager's office instead of yours, but that in every other way it would be identical. Now the only, and I haven't had a conversation with either of these members, the only thing that I would be uncomfortable with is if it is under my office, I don't feel like I can be a member on the committee. That, that seems wrong. But it is town manager or designee, so I have that way to run. Aside from that little wrinkle, I don't think it's functionally different. Um, you guys That's may have talked. That's the goal. I think you, I think you you're may right. have talked to town, town council and have more insight on that. But it seemed to me, from the discussion I had with uh, her a month ago, that town council is just trying to allow to happen legally what the board intends. And I think you're right. I think functionally it could operate the same, and there's a good faith effort that all open meeting laws would be followed. I think my concern is that it's not required, right? Because it falls. No, it would be required. It would be a policy that you would vote on. And just and so so folks are clear. Um, I didn't kind of. It was a month ago mm -hmm. or so that that I'd come up or Ray had come up with this proposal, and then knowing that there was. That, that Andy had some concerns about. I tried a different, I tried okay. to like plan B, but was not able to get to a place that would allow for um, the non-resident members to, to be included to the extent that they would feel like full members in the process. And so I came back to this as something that I thought would allow for full participation by all individuals who had been previously appointed. I think as far as, you know, it, we've seen that policies don't have to be followed. There is no um, state implication for us not following our select board policy. We've, we've seen this. So even if we were to vote, it's it, you were a little bit on the honor system here, which I'm sure, you know, I, I want to make clear that I believe that the committee, if it were reinstituted under the town manager, would abide by those, but I also hesitate, um, and it makes me a little nervous about what precedent we're setting where when things don't work out exactly the way we want them to, we just sort of work around them. Um, you know, sort of charter be damned, if you will. So. I, I can't support that option um, because it just feels like a workaround to me, and I'm, I'm not okay with that from a from a government policy perspective. Um, but then that leaves me in a little bit of a bind here because the alternative is to keep it as it stands. Um, I am a little bit concerned about the conflicting advice we seem to be getting from town council as far as what happened two years ago with the Board of Health example. I remember that I was in the room um, and what's happening here. Um, so I'm, I'm not comfortable with, with door number one, um, but I'm not fully on board with door number two. So I'd be open yeah, to whatever you're saying. Uh, I've, been, I've been a party to a lot of emails between Ann and Andy and town council as an observer. I don't, so I don't know if I've been a party to all the emails, um, but there was never a discussion of the Board of Health in comparison, just in fairness to Ray, right. that um, this true. is being suggested, but Ray has never had a chance to discuss it or describe why it's the same or different. That's fair. Thank yeah. you. Um, I, I think... I don't think the charter was set up to handle this sort of unique situation that we find ourselves in and that we find ourselves responding to. And, and, and as a select board member, um, and I think the select board should stand by um, or what we committed to originally and um, be very transparent about it. We, we, this is the path we chose. Um, I think, and I know this was not your this is not your intent, Ian, but I, I think that um, doing a little um, uh, shuffling around to make it okay uh, 
is in effect you're doing the same thing. I mean, the, the result will be the same. We'll have a non-resident uh, informing, um, or helping to inform the select board about um, a, f a future human rights board, um, which is the mission of this ad hoc committee. So it, it, I, I'd like the, the, this, you know, us to own this this thing and I understand that you won't John. No, I, and I won't because you know I put my hand up and said I'll support the charter and endorse the charter of the town of Reading. Yes. And the town of Reading has a charter clause mm -hmm. which our town council has said we're violating with this ad hoc as it exists. But you didn't have a problem with that in 2017 when we appointed First of all, let's stay on t task here. No, I think One about the other. Okay? All right, gentlemen, gentlemen, please. Um, let's bring it back to the issue before us. Um, my question to Andy and Anne is so we, we have we have a motion um, because we need to change one member. Um, there's a broader discussion of whether or not we expand the committee itself to include students. There's no motion here, but we can add that. Um, and then there's the matter of do we change this or do we do nothing and essentially keep up doing what we're doing? Is that a good summary of yeah? I wouldn't the issues put before the, us. I wouldn't put the students as a because uh, I think there's a little bit more cleanup to do okay so we're not there yet on yeah the, okay yeah. great um, there's just this one where we have the the change from the um, school committee yeah all right yeah um, other thoughts? So, uh, yeah I have a comment so um, the reality is that in particular for this group we need community members to be part of the group in some cases, they aren't residents, they aren't voting residents, if we talk about students possibly, but they're members of the community, and their involvement is crucial to what we're gonna do here, and it's perspective that we will not gain otherwise. Mm -hmm. It's not possible to replace them with residents who can bring the same perspective, or it would be an amazingly difficult task, and I suspect not possible. So the reality is, this is a community-based group. Now we have to figure out how do we make that happen? Because otherwise, if we either just stick to the charter or, or, or do a workaround, we're, we're somewhat missing the point, right? The point is that we need community involvement. How do we get it done? I don't think I have enough information to make a recommendation to you guys which way to go on it. I, I think both of them have issues. They both have warts. Um, but I think that things need to move ahead in a way that the members we're talking about and adding students to it can take place. And maybe it has to get pushed back a little bit to get a little bit more feedback and, and, and satisfy some of the concerns that people brought. Uh, I'm in agreement with Mark on this one. Are you comfortable sort of postponing the larger decision? Uh, we've yeah, totally yeah, been yeah, doing I that for that, Yeah, <laughs> we've been posting for it, but, but, but I, I'm, I'm happy to do it as long as we have minutes to approve that, that are go back to um, when Mark before we were on it yeah, Mark. and in March and and um, and as far as I'm concerned the board voted to appoint these all these individuals to um, the ad hoc and they should all we should vote all of us to approve these minutes at least I mean as it stands now you they are all members of the committee yeah unless we choose to take action otherwise. Yeah. yeah. So you could technically, I mean, unless legal can. Yeah. Basically, we were told they're not, I mean, they're that some not all are. are not members. Yeah. Well, even if they, given the sheer volume of people on this committee, yeah. even if that one individual or, you know, John right. at the time, um, you still have a quorum and you still have a majority. It's true, but... Yeah. I, right. I mean, I, I think it, could I, it would not. You know, that would not be a problem to get the minutes approved logistically, but it would mean that not everyone would have the same voice in the vote. It's minutes. It's not a you know. Oh, the vote matters. All right, but but yeah, there both. no there no it is a it is a, a 
a very real. Can always be in draft form if someone were to ask for them. We have the we have all the draft minutes, right. and they've been part of the packet. They can go to the clerk's office in draft form for now. They, yes. they've, they've been in parts of the part okay. of the package. I think that's so we have we're at least we covered on the one of the members of the of, there's a member of any public comment if he wants to say anything. No. Sure. Um Jeff Goldbus, one twelve Spruce Road, um, yes one yet yeah, committee, also on Human Rights Advisory Commission. So um one thank you. Um, thank you, Board, You're courageous in creating the ad hoc committee to go ahead and research this to get the data to find out how to be as inclusive as possible. Um, this won't come as a surprise, but I'm a white male, and so I don't necessarily have all the perspective that you would need in order to bring to a group like this. And so having as many people that can participate from those um, areas is needed. Um, I think I heard the stat, 87 or 89 percent of Reading is also white. So very difficult to find those people to participate either from residents or frankly from families that are actively participating um, from METCO and from others. So ways that we can keep them and everyone and even more involved I think is what's going to give the best recommendation to the board of where it should go. Um, this is a short-lived committee. It's only going until November. So changes, admin, respinning, I think does a couple of things. One, delays, and I won't talk much longer, which is also delaying. Um, but th the second thing it does, I think it changes, the tr it changes the trust. So the trust, as far as what was created, was the board created this ad hoc to make a recommendation. And now the board is changing where the ownership would be to another, even though that's not the intent. Um, the trust changes, and I know that there are people that are within that would look at that as I'm now a lesser. It's been changed, and or if I'm there but I can't vote, it's a lesser. So, um, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, and my my concern is is coming from the. I'm there, but I can't vote, so I'm lesser. And that, you know, I really am wanting to be committed to the most inclusive process moving forward. Okay. All right, so let's table the current structure and who owns it, and let's move forward with this motion to change one of the members. Yes. Mark? Move that the select board appoint Assistant Superintendent Christine Kelly to the Ad Hoc Human Rights Committee to stand in for Dr. Doherty during his leave of absence. A second? Second. All those in favor? Great. Lovely. Okay. Um, so, uh, Ann and Andy, we leave it to you to let me know when we're going to revisit this. We will get back to work. You may have uh, two different options to choose from, but uh, <laughs> just we'll see. Knowing that Mark needs more information, what more and what information more would be helpful? Uh, it'd be great to have Ray just come down and say, "Here is how the structure could work." That mm -hmm. would mean yes, open meeting law, yes, mm -hmm. inclusive membership, um, yes, chaired by mm -hmm. members of the select board, um, and that's more kosher mm -hmm. than other options. Okay. I would feel better about that. Or if he can't, I, I guess what I'm trying to do is see, can he say all oh, that's, that's all there? Or is he as well? Sort of magic door number three is what we're looking for. <laughs> I feel like that, that, fe that feels like his conversation with me, but I can understand if you want that to be in writing before the board. Yeah, and maybe what, what the structure would look like, mm -hmm. and uh, it it's, wouldn't be the goal to create Pandora's box. Absolutely. Right? Um, but there are also clearly some circumstances where this is one of them that not having, not having this group be more inclusive harms its mission, harms yes. its outcomes, yes. and yes. just doesn't, it, it yes. doesn't allow it to work, period. Agreed. And, and I just, I, maybe it's, it's Ray coming and saying, yep, here it is. And, and I guess on the flip side too, it's, it's him saying, you know, hey, okay, if you don't do this, um, if you keep it just exactly as it is, um, here are the repercussions, and here's the Pandora's box, box aspect of that too. And I think between that, then we just have to make a decision. We just vote and we're done. Yeah. Okay. Um, that would satisfy me. Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, I think that's, that's helpful. I think that's good. Um, 
Next up, we have future agendas. Before we jump to that, are there minutes? No. Oh, excellent. Okay. I was like to skip those apparently. Anyway. Um, all right. So for August 6th, um, we have discussion on senior tax relief, uh, potentially Austin Prep drainage project, waste air recycling, reviewing some DPW policies as part of the select board policy, uh, discussion on the second water meter. Is there anything else, Bob, that has? Yeah, there's, um, there's, I guess I'll call them recreation issues related to the uh, change in the high school hours and the fact that Turf 2 is offline. Um, um, I, you know, I have three different requests from the recreation, and I'll say department because I don't know if the recreation committee has formally voted. Um, those could be handled slightly preferably on the 6th, but it could wait till the 27th. You won't have some of the town staff present on the 27th. Um, I don't know if logistically from a procurement standpoint it also matters. I'll have to find that out, but I, we just had a meeting on today. So um, my inclination is to wait till August, August 27th when there's a full board when possible, uh, but this may be urgent. I mean, if it's urgent, it, yeah, do we have four members? Yes. Or three? Okay. Yeah. Let's, if we can put it on the 6th, I think that's fine. Okay. Yeah. And I'll um, keep you and John up to date, sir. Thank you. A couple of things that were in the packet that, um, just quick comment. One, um, you mentioned on senior tax relief, Victor is going to reach out. I would very much like to talk to him because I think okay. some of his answers raised more questions. <laughs> So I'd love to do that. Second is, I noticed that Daniel's house is closed. It says closing and relocation, but all I saw discussed is closing. Is there a plan to relocate it? They're re relocating the individuals at the house. Relocating the individuals. And they're doing it one by one. So we're just losing the facility in Correct. Right. Hmm. So before we jump to the correspondence section, is there anything else that we want to put on this agenda for August 6th and uh, and is the August 27th agenda seems light to me Bob is that yeah that's six or eight weeks from now so I'm sure it will fill so in I do okay. one more comment that fits both categories it's from correspondence but I think it relates to the future uh, topic MBTA um, there was a, yeah. a notice that said we could have we could recommend service pilots I'm wondering if we got to have a public discussion of what people would like to see in terms of MBTA service pilots meaning what kind of you know buses that run different right. hours or different routes or more other MBTA services? It just well, trains running on time. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's one you can do, but just the notion that um, they're offering service pilots. Okay. I wonder if we know well enough what that ought to be, and, and maybe it should be a public discussion. That might be a nice one for the sixth of the twenty seventh. Say, Julie is Julie Mercier, who was just here, is highly interested in that. Be happy to participate. Okay. Um, I think the 6th is a little bit better for that discussion because I know Jean would be available. I know she's not on the 27th. Well, work with staff. Okay. Um, we were wondering how to get feedback. <laughs> I think talking, putting it on the agenda is a great way of doing it. Okay. Um, and if it works out for the 6th, then that's fine by me. Okay, thank you. All right. Some of these future ag future agenda items, mm -hmm. are any of are these just not ready for prime time to put on a uh, um, discourse? I don't have a list if you want to ask me specifically. The, the, the Some discuss, of them definitely contingent. Discuss early Sunday hours at recreational parks. Um, that will be part of the recreation issues that I mentioned. Um, climate change in initiatives probably need a little more time on that Vanessa yes please um, um, you know one of the things that we could do maybe not for the 6th but for the mm -hmm. 27th is an update on from the subcommittees mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah um, I've met with various uh, I met with Ann and John it might be nice to have everyone reporting on their progress it also keeps us honest yep. yeah okay. all right let's do that for the 27th when we'll be at full board Anything else before we move on to correspondence? Do you have any other questions? Right. Mark, do you have any other comments on the correspondence section? Uh, one quick question. I know uh, the note from Gail Dowd about update on capital projects and the two projects starting. Um, I'm wondering what the best way to kind of stay in touch with the plan. Um, I think I read today that it's a little bit under budget. The bids came in under budget, and as a result, there's an opportunity to expand the dimensions slightly. On turf two? On turf two. Uh, mm, yes to the first part, no to the second part. Okay. Um, the, the, 
we should see what's in the paper because <laughs> okay. it implies it's I different. I highly recommend that you join uh, the school committee when they have updates because that's they discussed it two Thursdays ago. Last Thursday. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I just I, it. Um, I it's surprising, surprising. It, but if you really want to keep up to date. For Mark. We were there when they discussed. Yeah. Yeah. When they said we're going to um, go from three feet run out to ten feet run out. Well, I guess I guess that's not a change to me because that was discussed months ago. Oh, I think it's a, it's a change to uh, what was discussed publicly, what was discussed previously, and when the bidding process started. That's possible. Yeah, and because I, I was surprised by it. So, so, will it be the same size? The field is not changed. Okay. Sidelines, I think, are wider. Yeah. Correct. Well, that really wasn't where the problem was. No. Yeah, it's better drainage, and it's more bleachers. So I think we're in good shape there. Any other questions on correspondence? Okay. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? All right, before you guys run off, you have to sign all the amendments.